It's time to open the fourth board meeting of the year for the Board of Podiatric Medicine. For, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody. Are, are there uh, any uh, anybody in the room, who, any public members who would like to introduce themselves? All right, we'll start with uh, roll call, please. Good morning. Dr. Michael Zapp? Present. Dr. Judy Manzi? Present. Christina Dixon? Darlene Elliott? Not present. Maria? I'm sorry, did I say this? Cardenas? Present. Thank you. Neil Mansdorf? Present. Can I get that, everybody? <coughs> All right, thank you very much. Uh, as a note, the board may not discuss or take action on any matter raised during the public comment section except to decide whether to place the matter on the agenda of a future meeting. In a second, we're going to go into a closed session, but first I would like to welcome Maria to our board. Uh, we've been long awaiting for a third public member, and to have you here is a a great treat for us. Uh, thank you for being present with us. Now I'm going to call for a closed session for us to discuss some issues. Can we uh, go to item? We're going to do re review the minutes. Has anybody had a chance to review the minutes? <coughs> Does anybody see any changes to the minutes? I've got a couple. All right. Item one, public comments, I think needs to be moved, moved down to become new item three after president's welcome. Um, page two, item seven. Um, I think it would be helpful to clarify that David Chris is Chief of Division of Investigations at the Department of Consumer Affairs. And also strike from the Division of Investigations in that second line because that's already provided under receive update from the Division of Investigations. David Chris, comma, Chief of the Division of Investigations, comma, Department of Consumer Affairs, comma, provided update for the health, health quality investigation services period. Thank you. Any other proposed changes? I've got one more on page three, item 10. Discussion as topics, I think we should change as to of, so it would read discussion of topics for future board meetings. Any other comments? Can I hear a motion to approve the minutes? Make a motion. Approve the minutes. That was Judy Manzi, second. Is that a uh, motion to approve the minutes as revised? As revised, yes, as yeah. revised. <coughs> I think you may have to hold the vote, though, because I have to abstain. I wasn't at the meeting, and we have a new board member who also wasn't at the meeting. So you don't have sufficient approval numbers. You can hold for next meeting. Okay, we will hold that for the next meeting. Now we will enter closed session. Two tables and pull the microphone close to you. Uh, 
what you have to say. Just in time. Good morning, everyone. Again, for the record, John Chisholm, um, President-elect of CPMA, and I'm delighted to be included in your agenda today. Um, CPMA um, understands the, the, you know, the sharp difference between our mission, which is to take care of our doctors, and your mission, which is to take care of the consumers, but there's just always been a lot of overlap, and um, over the last couple of years, I've noticed that there seems to be an increasing um, level of communication and uh, coordination between the, our two organizations, you know, with the maintaining that strict boundary. So, um, I think I was just uh, asked to provide an update. So, um, I'm going to go over. I mean, CPMA has been very, very busy this year. Uh, we have a lot of stuff on the table currently, and so I'll briefly outline a few, all, most of the things that we're working on, with a minimum of detail. And then afterwards, if you guys want to. Or please feel free to interrupt me as we go on. It would probably be better that way if there's a level of detail that you want that's deeper than what I'm going to give you. So if there are no questions right off the bat, I'll just uh, dive in. Um, our, um, for the first time in decade, um, CPMA sponsored a uh, piece of legislation this year, AB 1153, whose um, purpose was to authorize uh, podiatrists to treat um, ulcerations and wounds uh, above the ankle to the level of the tibial tuberosity. Uh, the um, bill was uh, passed uh, unanimously and signed by the governor last month, which is a nice, was, which was nice for us. The thing that I wanted to spend a little bit of time on was the process that we um, went through to um, get that bill passed. Uh, at, you know, historically, scope of practice issues, especially among non-MDDO providers, has been an opportunity for um, CMA, the uh, different medical societies and the Medical Board of California and the uh, CPMA to all fight and over turf. And um, that has been improving. And this particular bill was probably the um, kind of a culmination of all our works at relationship building with the different stakeholders that they had in this bill. Uh, the bill um, as the result of discussions with um, the California Orthopedic Association, um, there were some. There were initially a large number of objections and an amendments. Through a process of education and um, dialogue, we were able to reduce those down to zero, and we had full support from the California Orthopedic Association for our bill. Uh, the dermatology uh, board. Uh, um, Society also had quest questions about this because there's some overlap in the in the type of treatment that's been given. But again, um, there was a conference call had. We had Dr. Stavosky from San Francisco report on what actually you know, the level of training of podiatric physicians. Um, after that process and um, a dem and and also a um, some uh, testimony on the types of care that's already currently being given and the kind of training that podiatry residents have in their in their. Uh, three-year training model now, dermatology also removed their opposition. So uh, everybody was on board with this bill. Um, it um, sailed through. And uh, my second topic is a, is, um, was a offshoot of our discussions with the Orthopedic Association for AB 1153. It concerns a memor memorandum of understanding that we signed with the COA at our last House of Delegates. And the memorandum of understanding is an agreement between both organizations that we would form a, um, a, uh, a panel that would consist of leaders from both organizations, um, president-elect, president, and past president for both associations. And, and um, that way, having a group of um, members that have some continuity along with the executive directors of both associations. One of the things that happens when you work collaboratively with other medical associations is that um, the presidents of the organizations may form, a, may have a good communication, they may accomplish a lot, but then the next year both are replaced by different people who have none of the historical background or the relationship or the benefit of the relationship building that went on before. So the thinking was that we would try to compose this group of um, some kind of a um, succession of leaders that would carry on from year to year and year. So there would be the, the relationship that we would build one year would be carried on to the next year. Um, this meant we had our first meeting of, the, of, the, of our uh, legislative um, um, group uh, last a couple weeks ago in San Francisco. At that time, we covered subjects ranging from um, fluoroscopy, the, the, the onerous fluoroscopy examination that we all medical professionals have to take in order to get fluoro um, certified, the um, lack of training 
programs available for our limited license techs that we need in our office. Really all of the th problems that um, we've historically had with the radiology um, branch of the, of the um, department have, um, you know, they, they're the exact same issues that the orthopedists face. So we set up a couple of task force and have some action items to work on with that. They, um, they heard the problems that we're having with Medi-Cal not only being included for coverage, but also in getting paid for our services, and they are 100% behind us in um, our attempt to get the Department to, to get the, um, the Department of Healthcare Services to do some work on the provider manual to get so that we can get paid. Uh, we um, talked about uh, DPM supervisions of physicians' assistants, and again, the orthopedic group um, understood that it's in all of our best interest to be able to supervise physicians' assistants, and that it is, um, there's, no, there's no logical reason why a licensed podiatrist in the state of California shouldn't be able to supervise within their scope of practice. Again, orthopedists um, of CMA has already come, well, that's, that's, I won't say that. The orthopedists are um, pledged to stand by us when we, um, any uh, meetings that we have with the physicians' assistants, physicians assistant group um, to try to bring that kind of a change about. A bunch of other things that, that are not um, really pertinent today. Um, yeah, any questions that, at this point? Yeah, do you see this as more of a segue into the physician surgeon designation or podiatry? Of course. Um, one of the um, one of the tasks that we've had in the Physicians and Surgeons Task Force has been to move, work with, and move past orthopedic objections to um, the, um, to, to the uh, concept that, um, that we can compare our education and training between podiatric physicians and um, MDs and DOs and find a ground for, for equivalency there. Um, the um, the memorandum that I'm glad um, it just reminded me of a point that I wanted to make. The memorandum of understanding was an attempt by both organizations to depoliticize the task force. The physicians and surgeons task force mission was an educational one to examine the curriculum, find out where we're at, and find out and decide where we need to go to in order to have equivalency with our with our education and training. That process has been hampered by political um, considerations. By having the CPMA and the COA meet in a um, group that is only devoted to um, legislative and political needs, that gives us an opportunity to interact in a way and remove that political and legislative uh, part of the piece from the Physicians and Surgeons Task Force. I think it's going to make the task force be able to function a lot better. And then they're, we're coming to some kind of a conclusion on that. I'll cover that when I talk about the Physicians and Surgeons Task Force. Um, but um, the, um, I, find, I think that this memorandum of understanding and the uh, panel that we've set up to try to work collaboratively is going to be incredibly helpful for the Physicians and Surgeons process, simply because it will allow them to, if they have questions or needs that have to do with legislative or um, cooperative political action, we have a, now have a um, vehicle for that. And we don't have to use the physicians and the task force as that vehicle. And when you look at the um, representation on the panel, on this panel you're talking about, mm -hmm. does it cover a, um, a broad generational group? Or is it, you know, people that are early in practice, people who have been in practice a long time, The meeting that we had in San Francisco, although the um, sitting members of the group are, as I described, in the, in the leadership, um, at that meeting we also brought our legislative councils, ex, uh, the executive um, board of the COA happened to be in town having a meeting. That's why we scheduled it that day. So there were many members of their executive board that were, that were also attended there. So in addition to the people that I just described, there was an additional four or five orthopedists and one other podiatrist there. So by having that larger group, you know, contributing to the discussion, we had, you know, the medical association leadership tends to be older. Um, there is 
it's difficult for someone who there's a nat natural um, training ground that we give our um, young podiatric leaders in terms of them becoming involved on the local society level. Then they may have some con consulting work that they do with CPMA. And then finally, if they decide that they, if once they have gotten some seasoning, they tend to run for the CPMA board and then rise to leadership through a number of years. So just that alone makes it hard to bring in truly young members into this process. So I would say that the experience and the ages and experience level of the participants of this group ranged anywhere from people that were six to eight years out in practice to guys like me that have been in, at this for 30 years. So it, it, it covered that whole spectrum. I bring it up because I see like in the res as the residency teaching programs ha have evolved, the, these residents are of course on complete equal footing with all the medical residents of all specialties in the hospital. So their familiarity with what you do, what I do, what I know how to do, what you know how to do, is much different than I believe what happened 25 years ago. So I think that there is this you know, benefit to the younger group, basically, because they're there's a benefit to the younger group actually, you know, um, being involved on both sides of the fence because I think they're much more comfortable with what's going on and wh who, who knows how to do what. Yeah, I, I agree with that as well. Um, in our, for the podiatry representatives to the, um, to the advice, to the, um, group, the, the orthopedic group meeting that we had, there were, there was myself, um, my colleague Diane Branks, who went to school with me, so we were on the older side. And President Glazer um, is a three-year trained podiatrist, and so was um, so was past President Molner. So we had three-year trained podiatrists. We had a couple of one-year trained podiatrists to kind of give that give, give that flavor. But but I agree with you that the I mean the when if the Physicians and Surgeons Task Force is able to um, and we're able to put forth legislation that will allow us to be to obtain the physicians and surgeons certificate, it's going to be for future graduates. There'll be the 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 the, um, the question of what to do about those who um, don't have a physicians and surgeons certificate is going to have to be addressed by some sort of um, backfilling uh, process where they can sit for that if they wish to to do the backfilling process. But the I mean clearly the um, it. Our orthopedic colleagues have a lot of, um, you know, I'm not, I'll be honest with you, you know, all my dealings with the orthopedic group in the last two years, I have not seen that generational gap become an issue. And I, I'm not exactly sure why, because clearly people who have my level of training and experience are at a different level than those of my, you know, my, my two associates who have three-year programs and are able to do everything below the tibial tubercle. So um, I think that the group that we formed is representative, but that um, th this new generation of podiatric physicians who are trained to do everything is um, clearly, is, it, it's already starting to um, be the norm rather than, I, I think I'm the exception when it comes to levels of experience and training that our orthopedic colleagues are used to encountering. It was a very long around the horn answer, I did my best. Uh, next um, issue I want to talk about was Medi-Cal. Uh, I, Medi-Cal is my passion. I um, am a Medi-Cal provider and have been for my whole 30 years and, and I am one of the few guys in town that serves that, that very needy, underserved population. And so um, the current situation with um, podiatry and Medi-Cal is that uh, just to re, re, rehash a little bit of history, about three years ago, um, the Department of Healthcare Service Services became aware um, through, I think it was through a sunset review, that um, podiatrists were being called into the emergency room contractually with, with, without an ability to say no. I, um, a lot of podiatrists have contracts with hospitals that say that we, you won't discriminate with, based on insurance. They're, so they're called in to treat Medi-Cal beneficiaries. They're not allowed to say no, and when they do treat them, they're, they're not paid. And, there's, and very often at these hospitals, the podiatrist is the head of the limb salvage team. So 
he's the one who's, who's running that whole ship. Everybody else gets paid except for the podiatrist. As a result of that, the Department of Health Care Services made some changes to the provider manual and the optional benefits exclusion section that allowed uh, podiatrists to be paid in these new places of settings. This is old history. To date, I'm not aware of one single claim that a podiatrist has submitted for that kind of work over the past two and a half years that's been paid. I'm aware of a whole stack of denials. I've not seen there isn't one out there. I haven't been able to find it. Um, so, and, and what's more, as I've been endeavoring to network with all the California podiatrists and identify these claims and try to figure out how to get them claimed, one by one by one, the podiatrists that I've worked with through California have given up the process. Some of them are still providing the care. Some of them have withdrawn from the care. But every one of them has given up billing Medi-Cal. It's just too time. It's too time intensive and time consuming for a process that even if you were successful would be a small amount of money. And since no one is successful, everyone's just given up. So I'm a, I'm a, at this point, I'm unable to even find a denied claim in California. Um, the reason for this problem, I believe, lies in the provider manual. The provider manual has a podiatry section that was begun, be, written back in the 1960s, has been cut and pasted since then to a unreadable jumble of contradictory and confusing statements on what kind of authorizations are needed, how many visits can be done, what places of service they can be provided in. It's a mess. And, um, and because of that, I don't believe that the Department of Healthcare Services knows how to pay a podiatry claim, much less that we know how to submit one. So this, um, this came up in the uh, meeting with the orthopedic group. They were aware of some of these issues and not aware of others of them. They pledged to go with us um, on any ask that we have of, the, of Medi-Cal. Our orthopedic colleagues, judging from the, um, uh, from the tone and the words that were spoken at the meeting that we had, are absolutely comfortable with this idea that in the area of limb salvage, um, partial amputations of the foot, and other kinds of diabetic foot wound life and limb saving surgeries, podiatry is the expert in that field. Their members are want to cooperate, and in fact, most of them want to simply leave that part of medical care to the podiatrist. It's good that they do that because it's, I mean, if you review the amount, the codes, you know, the podiatrists already own those codes in terms of utilization. Very, very few orthopedists are providing limb salvage. Lots and lots of podiatrists are. So um, we got the orthopedists behind us on that. Uh, two days ago, I was on a phone call with um, Ryan Spencer, our legislative counsel, and uh, John Abordo, our Medi-Cal chairman. We brought those concerns, as I just spoke them to you, to the uh, Medi-Cal staff. Uh, the, it was a long conversation. Uh, there was a lot of um, going back and forth. The department's um, position right now is the parts of the provider manual that are keeping us from getting paid are of a regulatory nature and need to approach that way. Our, uh, Mr. Spencer is going to attempt to work with them to have the regs changed so that podiatrists aren't subject to some of these TAR, some of these authorization and utilization limits that are in place. Uh, and at the same time, Dr. Umbordo and I, are they, they offered, and I took them up immediately, that they said, well, if you have any suggestions to how to fix the provider manual, we'll listen. So I'm going to, me and Dr. Umbordo are going to huddle together in a couple of weeks, and we're going to write an entirely new podiatry section. I doubt whether they're going to accept it the way I write it. It'll be very, very short, you know, to pay us exactly the way you pay the MDs and DOs. Because really, when you think about it, that's the logical solution here. We're doing exactly the same services. The codes that we use to, to um, treat a diabetic infection and do limb salvage are exactly the same codes that a general surgeon, that a podiatrist, that a uh, orthopedist, that a um, plastic surgeon. We're using the same codes. We're doing the same thing. It's just that their claims get processed in about three or four days and ours don't get processed. They get denied. So there's a very logical um, reason why it would make sense to simplify this whole process and just have our claims processed exactly the same the way MD and DO's claims are processed. Um, department of the, the phone, on the phone call, the uh, department seemed to indicate that their hands were tied. They couldn't make any changes. So we're going to do everything we can to get those changes made and hopefully get um, Medi-Cal to be back um, and, and try to now, and, and the hard part is going to be getting our member podiatrists to agree to participate in the program again. They're all, they've all just had, they've had enough of it, and it's going to be hard to get them to agree. And citizens of California need that care. Questions? No, but I think it's definitely a consumer issue. And 
it's denying care to and it's actually, it's actually putting our consumers at risk. You know, a Medi-Cal patient shows up in an ED with, you know, an infected limb and septic and it has to be dealt with immediately. You know, and you you can't refuse care, but yet they're not going to pay you. It makes no sense. And and again, I, I just wanted to reemphasize that. I perhaps I spent a little bit of time on the payment part. The problem with not getting paid is is much more than a financial thing. It's an access of care problem. Mm -hmm. Now that there are no podiatrists in California who are willing to take these people, that's the problem. Is that they're they're not getting the care they need, or they're getting. Um, their amputations done by plastic surgeons or vascular surgeons who have little to no training in that. So it's, it's, not, it's not good for citizens of California. No, what usually happens is they succumb to a higher level of amputation. That's what I usually see, where the limb truly is not salvaged when it could have been. I agree with that. Well, good, good job. Uh, hopefully, I don't know if we can help. Let us know. I, I think we'll, um, I mean, the, this last phone call that we had clearly um, gave us some action items to get on, so I'm going to be doing that. Uh, the last thing I'll talk about is Physicians and Surgeons Task Force. Uh, for the past two years, um, the task force completed its work about two years ago. There were questions from the orthopedic uh, members of the task force as to whether the site visits for the residency programs were I don't have the word for it, whether they were sufficient. Um, there was an agreement made that in return for the orthopedic group helping us with some of our other issues that we kind of talked about, that the, pro that the process of the site visits for the residency programs would re be revisited. Um, they, um, a, um, every one of the stakeholders, CME, CPMA, CMA, CPMA, and the orthopedic group brought, hired a um, ACGME, that's the group that certifies residency programs, an ACGMA qualified expert. Um, we revisited the, the residency programs. Reports have been written. Um, the Physicians and Surgeons Task Force will review those um, reports at their next meeting, which was to, at their next full meeting of the task force, which should be in February or March, at which time they'll probably be accepted. And at that point, the task force um, initial mission to examine the education and training of podiatrists and see if it's sufficient to have a physicians and surgeons certificate issued that will be done. We've asked for and are hoping to get a final report from the um, from the task force on their findings. Um, we're hoping that'll be forthcoming. When it is, um, CPMA is poised like a sprinter um, at the start line in a crouch to um, craft legislation to um, include uh, DPMs with the necessary, um, ex with all the necessary elements that make up the requirements for a physician's and surgeon certificate from them to join MDs and DOs and being eligible to, uh, to be granted that certificate. Questions? There was talk, of, talk about a select group of students taking one of the medical exams at the Oakland School. Has that happened? That has happened. That happened last spring, I believe. Um, the results of that are um, not, they're, they're the property of the school. The school has not been um, willing, has, well, it's not willing. Not, no, I don't know, I'm not, not sure anybody has asked, but this, the school has not shared the results of that test. Um, CPMA has concerns that the students were not given adequate um, preparation to do well on that test. This, the APMA made funds and, um, and um, personnel available to conduct review courses and um, pay for the students to attend review courses to prepare for the LCME. But it's not the LCME, it's actually a, a, a practice version of the LCME that, the, that, they, that they administer. So the, and, and the Oakland School chose to not take advantage of those. So to my knowledge, the, um, CPM, the um, CSPM students did not get any review work done, and they, were, um, they essentially took the test cold. So I, and I don't know what the results of that were. The, um, the Western 
University uh, School of Podiatric Medicine is scheduled to take the test next year. They have, um, are going to work with APMA and they have already, I think they're working on scheduling some review courses. They're going to try very hard to prepare their students to do well on that test. Um, that, the, the testing piece of, the, um, of this process is, is important, but um, well, there's, it's a very long history of, of why, of how hard it's going to be for podiatry to be, for podiatrists to be able to take that exam. There's, a, uh, there's some hurdles that have to be overcome for that. And I, uh, it'll take me a long time to go through all that history, but it's, I'm th I think maybe some of you are already aware of it. But the, um, the testing component is key. We, it's certainly not in place yet, but, I, but I, I don't think it's gonna be necessary for that to be firmly in place when we write our legislation. I think you know, we'll probably um, have some sort of a exam that we specify in the, regu in the requirements for physicians and surgeons. It will probably be something like LCME. It might be COMLEX. Complex might be the right. The DO students, students take complex, mm -hmm. which is a which has a which has step one, step two, and step three the same as LCME, and um, but it also has a added section that it, it's very very similar to um, the LCME except it has an added section um, for osteopathic medicine. Taking, um, having podiatry, uh, podiatry licensees take a version of the COMLEX is on the table. And in fact, the osteopathic physicians and surgeons of California have their, one of the task force members is, a, is their testing consultant for the osteopathic surgeons and ph physicians and surgeons of California. And they've expressed a willingness to um, work with the association to produce a test that but I that'll be um, similar to the complex and will be um, able to be used to meet the license the testing requirement that the law will require is it envisioned that podiatry will write its own exam that's that's choice C choice a would be we, we have three choices we can write our own exam um, it will be probably difficult to get our stakeholders, CMA and the orthopedic group and people like that, to sign on to that. Um, we can take LCME if we can gain approval from LCME to administer it to them, or we can take COMLEX. So we have three possible avenues. Probably the one that is going to be the least palatable to the other stakeholders is going to be a podiatry-specific podiatry-designed exam. In fact, I don't believe that the task force We'll wait to see what the what the task force report says before I speculate on it. And what about the, well, I don't know what the update for the ECFMG, the foreign medical graduate exam? Is that an option? I don't know. It's been, it certainly has been discussed. In fact, from the birth of the Physicians and Surgeon Task Force, that was always one of the avenues that we could go down. I believe that early on, all of the state, all of CMA, CPMA, and COA all decided that that was not the route that they wanted to take. This is my memory of that, it was about eight years ago. Um, so at this time, I, my, I, I think my, my, the best answer I can give you is that that is not being considered as one of the pathways. Thank you, any questions from the board? Any other questions? Or anyone? Well, thank you very much, John. That's thank you very much. Um, there's a, um, I'm not sure if you have on your agenda, um, the um, President Glazer had, was going to have uh, Ryan Spencer, our legislative advocate, talk um, about asking the Board of Podiatric Medicine to consider supporting a um, Department of Consumer Affairs advisory group. Is that, a is that a separate, does anyone know what I'm talking about? And if so, is it a separate topic or should I address it now? Uh, that's a separate topic, but I think you met with the director. It kind of came up there. Yes. He's in process of working on that, and that's all I know at this point. So okay. It's, it's still in, in the works. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. All right. Gloria Castro, are you here?
Yes. We're going to receive a report, the Office of the Attorney General's Legal Process for Disciplinary Actions, a report by Gloria Castro, Senior Assistant Attorney General. Thank and Dr. Zapp, I recommend that we take a short break while they set up. All right, we can take a short break. Yes, good morning. Good morning all. Uh, my name again is Emily Brinkman. I'm a Deputy Attorney General uh, for the State of California. Um, my current role, besides being a, a, a line DAG as we call it, is to serve as the Podiatry Board's liaison. Um, so I work with our office and mostly your exec staff on any issues that the Podiatry Board may have. I've been in front of you, a, a few of you before. Um, welcome to the new member. Um, so I'm always available for um, the board if there are issues that arise. Uh, I also serve as a role, uh, and I'll get into this more in the presentation, as the lead prosecutor for one of our um, district offices, investigation offices. And so we help and advise the investigators in the Health Quality Investigation Unit to process and uh, get investigations moved and through the process to hopefully get to our office for prosecution. Um, feel free if you have questions throughout the presentation to ask them, otherwise there's a portion at the end. So today I'm going to discuss briefly the laws and regulations that arise from the, uh, for the medical board excuse me, the podiatry board's enforcement uh, process. And you're under Business and Professions Code section 2530 is where your code sections start. Um, also, the Medical Practices Act um, applies, and I'll get into that in a bit. As you're all aware, your primary purpose of the podiatry board is public protection. And so, as the Attorney General's office, we want to ensure that that public is protected by doing those investigations and getting them through the process so that we can get as quickly to a result uh, for discipline of that uh, licensee as quickly as possible to get that licensee rehabilitated uh, if possible or uh, removed as a licensee if uh, necessary. Now the board has separate functions as well, and you're all aware that part of your job with running the board or being members of the board is rulemaking and working with the um, DCA council for your uh, public meetings and legislation and all of those sorts of administrative type tasks. You also, as a board, look at setting scope of practice and duties of your licensees. Uh, you're also involved in examinations and ensuring qualifications of new licensees and continued uh, education and training requirements of current uh, licensees. Uh, another role is the job of funding and fee scheduling with your licensees, which is always a fun topic. With the Attorney General's office, our role in the enforcement process is uh, a, few, a few different ways. One is, as part of the vertical enforcement model, uh, we help and assist uh, the investigations get processed. Uh, and the podiatry board is part of the vertical enforcement model, so this means that we work hand in hand with those investigators, making sure that we are getting the right evidence, that we are selecting the right and most qualified expert to provide an opinion and review of the case, 
to assist in subject interviews um, and really try and get as smoothly and as quickly through that investigation process as we can. Once the investigation process is completed, uh, it comes over to the Attorney General's office to make a decision about filing and prosecuting those cases and an accusation form. We can also take a few other steps uh, if an immediate action is uh, necessary, such as an impaired uh, licensee, we can go in and, and seek an interim suspension order. Uh, we can also ask for a, a, what we call an 820 order, a petition to compel uh, an, a mental examination as needed. So we can do those steps very quickly, uh, the ISO process and the 820 process, a little bit quicker sometimes than the accusation if we're determined that there is a public safety uh, issue. We also conduct probation violation hearings for your licensees uh, that are on probation and unfortunately run into some trouble. We will do uh, file and conduct the statement of issues hearings, so that's when a licensee, an applicant has a, uh, been denied a license and is entitled to a hearing, so we'll conduct that hearing. Uh, we can also assist in contested uh, site and fine hearings um, under the government code. And finally, we appear in superior court for any writs that occur following the discipline and position of the board um, that licensees are challenging. Um, it's not on the slide, but we also do on occasion represent board members or uh, experts, consultants, if they're sued by licensees. Fortunately, we don't see those very often, but we can uh, play that role as well. Now, administrative actions are what we are dealing with involving uh, the licensees, and they're slightly different than the other two types of uh, court proceedings that people are more famili most familiar with, the criminal and the civil cases. For administrative pr uh, proceedings, what we're dealing with is the property right. Your license is considered a property right. So given that uh, there are certain burdens of proof that we have to meet, and in an administrative context, it's a clear and convincing burden of proof, and it's all governed under the Administrative Procedures Act. They are a mix of civil and criminal proceedings as well, so take a little bit of uh, uh, work from both those uh, other core areas. So in a criminal case, obviously your liberty interest is, is, a liberty interest is at stake, and that burden of proof is the highest at a reasonable, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. The other type of uh, criminal or court case is a civil case, and that's the lowest burden of proof, which is more likely than not, and you're den generally dealing with monetary. So the administrative sort of sits right in the middle um, with these types of processes, and that's what we're, uh, we deal with with the administrative context. Section uh, 2497 of the Business and Professions Code is what sets out what the board is uh, allowed to do regarding licensees, which means you can deny or approve uh, applications for licensees, suspend licensees, revoke, uh, impose probationary conditions on your licensee, and that proceeding can be done by the board itself or with the assistance of administrative law judge. The other thing to be aware of with the podiatry board is that the Medical Practice Act is also applicable under um, the 2497 uh, Business and Professions Code links you to section 2222, which is of the Medical Practice Act. Um, so anything that is in the Medical Practice Act is also applicable to podiatrists. Uh, and so that allows us, uh, well at this point, the board doesn't, the podiatry board doesn't need to have a whole different set of regulations since the Medical Practice Act is applicable. So what does all of that mean? Well, again, you're issuing those licenses, or you're, you can even issue a license subject to conditions, what we often call a probationary license, and that would be under the Business and Professions Code Section 480, and that's a section that applies to generally all licensing boards um, in California. 
The other options are to set, suspend a license, revoke a license, place them on probation with terms and conditions. The point of, of the uh, suspension and or the probation is to ensure that that licensee is getting the rehabilitation necessary and not uh, punitive. So once the board has decided to take action on a license, what, are you, what is permitted? Well, there are, uh, under Section 2233 of the Medical Practices Act, the board could issue a public reprimand, which is the lowest level of discipline. Uh, also be aware that the board has another avenue for what we call a public reproval. It's this also, they have similar impacts, but it's under a different section of the Business and Professions Code, uh, Section 437. Uh, these happen very rarely. It's when there is a finding that there has been um, unprofessional conduct on some level, but it's not giving the rise that uh, additional education, training, or monitoring is required or revocation of a license. But it is sufficient enough that discipline should be imposed and a record should be kept. Uh, now, when we say for the next type of uh, action that you can take is to revoke that probation but we st uh, revoke that license. That license, however, can be, that revocation can be stayed and the licensee can be placed on probation. And uh, you're all aware that you have disciplinary guidelines and within those guidelines, the type of unprofessional um, conduct alleged has certain um, ranges of discipline that can be imposed. Yes? Um, issue a public record. You can also impose the disciplinary guidelines Yes, but the uh, in reality, it's a little bit harder to enforce uh, conditions on public reprimands because they're supposed to be for a very sort of limited scope and time. Whereas if you want someone to take classes or conditions, we need a mechanism to know how they're, in fact, complying with those conditions. And a public reprimand doesn't always include, you know, there's not a probation monitor to check with. Um, so it's usually when they don't, they've, maybe they've done all the training and additional training, they already did it before the discipline was entered, so they don't need anything additionally, but again, they do, some level of discipline is appropriate, a minor level of discipline. Um, so we have seen public reprimands with perhaps a medical record keeping. One discrete kind of course, that can be done as a condition. As a condition. Um, it, if there's something with the licensee that you feel, you know, they really need to be monitored, they need to take several classes, those are the cases that a public reprimand, uh, it, is it really appropriate then? Because you, the goal is to ensure that they've gotten the rehabilitation and they're safe to practice medicine, and they're safe for that, the public is protected. Um, so you want to really make sure that perhaps a probation then with a period of monitoring the board, by the board would be more appropriate. And um, if I may interject, as a condition precedent, um, you can impose such conditions. So you could say, um, once you provide proof that you have completed this course, et cetera, et cetera, then, we, then and only then will we issue this public letter of reprimand. And then that way, um, if they do not complete the condition precedent, then you know, we, we can move forward. Sorry. Um, as a condition precedent, uh, that would be the best way to put teeth into that for enforcement. Uh, a probation um, period can also include suspension, and the guidelines include a range of suspension. Uh, and again, that isn't always, a lot of licensees feel that that's punitive, and it's, but often that period of suspension is a necessary time that that physician needs to get the rehabilitation going, particularly in cases with substance abuse issues, and they need a period of suspension so they can do rehabilitation, substance abuse rehabilitation, and those sites of, sorts of things. So it, it's not a, a punitive uh, form, but it is part of the rehabilitation. But that is an option um, that we have. Uh, the board can also accept surrender of license, uh, a license. Uh, once an investigation is pending, though, um, the licensee isn't permitted to just surrender their license with that investigation pending 
um, because there's no permanent surrender uh, or revocation of a license in the state of California. So you don't want your investigation to sort of get stalled because the licensees decided to surrender and then a few years later come back and try and reapply for licensure when you don't know what was going to happen with that investigation. So what we require on those cases um, when the doctors indicated that they would like to surrender is we will in fact complete the investigation and we will file ac an accusation so that there is a pleading, there is a record, and then if and when that licensee wants to come back and reapply for a licensure in three years, there's a record of what got them surrendered in the first place. Have they remedied the problem that gave rise to that in the first place? And finally, you can revoke the license. And that generally requires, uh, the, that requires due process. And so that uh, the full uh, accusation gets filed uh, and served on the licensee. We do the hearing in front of the Office of Administrative Hearings. Uh, and it comes then before the board for a decision. And sometimes we do oral argument in front of you folks to uh, further discuss why the conditions of uh, a revocation is necessary. And it may often result in a writ at that point too. But those are generally your options with disciplinary actions. This is a list, it's not exhaustive, but generally these are the kinds of actions that we're taking discipline on. Um, one that we see regularly are convictions of a crime. The key though is that that crime must be substantially related, and I'll get into what exactly that means in a bit. But DUIs are very common. Uh, recently, we, there, you see a lot of uh, sexual misconduct cases, as is in the news. So if there are cases involving sexual misconduct, and there are criminal cases pending, that allows our office to actually go into superior court and file what we call a, a penal code section 23 bail restriction. So if there are criminal charges pending, we can go into superior court and say, this physician, this podiatrist should not be practicing medicine while these criminal charges are pending because they're so egregious and they're such a, a threat to public safety. So we can do that immediately and take that action, but it is coupled with the criminal process and how that proceeds. Um, we can also go in with uh, often, again, when charges, criminal charges get filed, ask for an interim suspension order from the Office of Administrative Hearings. And again, that's a much quicker proceeding. Uh, we can do them on the papers as opposed to bringing in uh, witnesses and doing a full-blown hearing. And that uh, also has time limits for then when an accusation and, and the full due process is required. Uh, substance abusing licensees are also a big one and um, making sure that they are not a danger to themselves and others. What you'll, uh, another area that we most often see are the standards of care violations, which are the gross negligence, repeated negligent acts, and incompetence cases, just with the specific procedures that have been performed and the care provided on a patient. Uh, within that, you also have me medical record keeping, and is that record keeping adequate? Those often are, uh, the standard of care and the record keeping are often coupled together. We see them together, uh, in generally in cases. Uh, and I think um, the electronic medical record changes to that haven't necessarily improved medical record keeping because there are a lot of um, issues that occur with EMRs that didn't necessarily occur with handwritten notes. So we're still seeing problems. Um, uh, I also mentioned earlier the mental and physical impairment issues. So you've got a physician who has they, did they have a stroke? Did they have some sort of medical issue that happened? Are they suffering from an addiction or some sort of mental illness? And we need to, again, go in quickly to get a suspension uh, or take action on that license and not allow them to practice. And so that's the 820 cases. We also will look at aiding and abetting unlicensed practice of podiatry. Um, and so that can also go into the criminal case because there are criminal sections, penal code sections involving the unlicensed practice of medicine. So with, 
conviction cases, what is required are that the conviction be substantially related. And so what that means is that there has to be some level, some nexus, some connection between the practice of podiatry and their fitness as podiatrists um, at issue. Uh, a lot of case law has set out various types of conduct as to that is substantially related. Uh, obviously, if it's conduct that's occurring during the practice of podiatry, you know, sexual misconduct within the office while treating a patient, clearly substantially related. Now, the question is what happens outside of the office when the physician isn't practicing? Then we have to look on a case-by-case -case basis to see if that conduct, in fact, is substantially related and whether uh, we can proceed with a disciplinary action. For crimes, we've got a couple cases, um, well, many cases that give us our starting point. One, is there a guilty or no contest plea? For administrative purposes, a no contest plea is considered exactly the same, so we don't even get into the weeds of whether it's a no contest or guilty. For licensing, it means the same thing. Um, uh, another thing, if there's a criminal case pending, um, in an administrative context, there is no right to a Fifth Amendment uh, privilege, the right to against self-incrimination. So if we are able to proceed sometimes much quicker than a criminal case to a disciplinary case, that licensee can be required to take the stand in a disciplinary matter. And if they plead the fifth because of the implications on the criminal case, that in fact can be taken against them in the administrative office. That can be used against them. Um, we don't see those cases are happening as much, but it can happen. Um, so it's something to be aware of. And the other big case that we use, reg use regularly is Watson. We see lots of DUIs. Just a DUI, uh, a lot of physicians will say, I wasn't practicing, I wasn't on call, it's not related. Well, the Watson case has said that yes, uh, a DUI in, uh, while you're not practicing, while you're on your time, is substantially related because it shows the la that lack of professional judgment um, that one would expect of a licensed um, podiatrist. Uh, now, whether we're prosecuting for single DUIs or multiple DUIs uh, is something that we will look at on a case-by-case -case basis. What's the, what are the factors surrounding the DUI, if it's a single DUI, was it a high blood alcohol, uh, those sorts of things because unfortunately people make mistakes and we don't necessarily want to take and revoke everyone's license for those kinds of mistakes. So again, it's part of the process and looking at the facts of each case individually. For the standard of uh, care cases, what the quality of care cases that you folks see, I think probably more than anything, are the incompetence, is this physiatrist qualified to do these procedures? Have they received the correct training? Um, or are they gross negligent and just completely not competent? To, or uh, have they just completed such errors that they need additional education? These are all related to that standard of care and that goes back to some of the scope of practice issues that you all deal with when determining what uh, is at play for podiatrists. And how you look at that standard of care is the degree at which a reasonably prudent podiatrist would practice under similar circumstances. So with the term gross negligence, how we uh, define that is that no reasonably pr prudent physician would act in that manner. They show a want of scant care in their treatment. And so there's case law that sets out what that really means. Now, we use the term repeated negligent act, and generally that occurs when we have what we call simple negligence, meaning there's a, it's a lesser departure from that standard of care. A reasonably prudent physician might make this kind of mistake, but it doesn't rise to the level that it's just no reasonably prudent physician would ever do, such as in a gross negligent case. So what you'll see with simple negligence, uh, uh, 
are there are multiple simple departures found by an expert during their review, and we qualify, we term that as a repeated negligent act. So how does this process actually work? The complaint comes into the board, um, and that will start that investigation. Um, there is at the very end, and I think you might have been given a handout of a, a flow sheet that shows you how complicated this is, and I've got a slide at the end, um, but you've got that flow sheet, but so that will show you this process. and. This is very simplified if you compare it with the flow chart. So once that investigation comes in, there can be a decision whether that investigation can be done, sort of what we call a desk review, such as a statement of issues case where we just need to gather, the staff for the board just needs to gather that evidence um, and provide it to the Attorney General's office, or does it actually need to go out to an investigator so that they need to meet with the witnesses, they need to interview the subject, they need to get medical records and do a much more exhaustive review than just obtaining documents. So once that decision um, to investigate is made, records will be subpoenaed if necessary. So a lot of times we do get authorizations uh, for those medical records from the uh, patients. Um, we get all of those interviews done mm -hmm. of all those witnesses and those patients. Sometimes during an investigation of one complaint, other issues then arise that we also add. Yeah. Oh, oh, we can finish that. Sorry. Okay. Um, once we have all of the evidence, including the subject interview, which the podiatry board has their own set of medical consultants, and they receive uh, yearly training um, on their role as medical consultants, they look at the cases, they uh, work it up with the investigator as well as with the, the DAG that is assigned or with the lead prosecutor assigned to that office, get those subject interviews done. And then an expert from your panel uh, is then selected to do their own separate review uh, and unbiased look at this case. Uh, and hopefully, uh, sometimes they, the medical consultant for your board will make written opinions. We try to not have those opinions go to the experts because again, we want them to look at this with fresh eyes and be completely unbiased. Um, as you all know, you're a small board, so sometimes it's a little harder to find experts that don't have conflict. So we do use experts from all over the state. You know, even cases in Northern California, we, we sometimes use case experts from Southern California because there is that lack of connection um, between yourselves. Uh, that expert determines then whether there are those departures in the standard of, standard of care whether it was gross negligence, simple negligence. Uh, are they competent? And so was that looking at their CV and what training they received uh, and listening to the subject interview and discussing those issues, is their incompetence involved? So if there are departures, then that investigation is referred to our office to start our portion of the prosecution. Dr. Zapp? If the complaint is about patient Adams, would the only case be being reviewed be the Adams case? Yes, but sometimes we have seen uh, during cases um, they additional patients get found for whatever reason. The investigators have a process where they can initiate then a complaint and let the board know we've got additional patients that have come forward. Um, we don't see it so much with podiatry board, um, but with over-prescribing cases, um, often we'll get a patient complain in about, you know, this doctor's over-prescribing opiates to this patient. The medical consultants can also look at the cures report. Are you all familiar with the cures reports? So they'll look at the cures reports and identify are there additional patients that perhaps also have over-prescribing issues. So additional patients can be added on that way. But again, we don't see that many over-prescribing from podiatrists, um, which is good. <laughs> and, and one other um, scenario where you might see additional patients getting added are if there had been an investigation previously that maybe fell on this simple departure department where an expert's reviewed it, it's a de minimis violation, um, but if that investigation is still within the statute of limitations, so it's still reachable even though you closed it, let's say within that statutory period we get another complaint. Um, our 
our staff works closely with the podiatry board staff to look at the prior complaints against this physician, this podiatrist, see if any of those practices have been brought um, to bear either in a prior disciplinary matter or closed within statute investigation. Um, and sometimes I think that that's the biggest value of having an attorney involved in the early process is the evidence really drives the outcomes. It's all factual. We want really, really strong evidence. And most certainly if somebody has had a closed investigation because it was a de minimis violation, if you put it together with a second patient, similar facts, we may have another uh, ability to protect the public that way. So um, that's another way that, you know, reviews of cures obviously always will bring in other meritorious patient complaints if the medical consultant feels it's appropriate. Do you ever get generalized complaints such as, I don't know, I'm just going to make some stuff like, the doctor <coughs> uses the needles, yes. but you don't have any specific cases to point to. How do you investigate that? Yeah, we get, we get cases like that all the time where, you know, this, this doctor is doing something wrong and there's no patient name, there's, so where do we start? Well, that's where working with the medical consultant, the lead prosecutor, the DAG, and the investigator working together to sort of brainstorm, all right, where do we start? We don't have any patient information. Well, let's go do a drop by of the office of the, the podiatrist and let's see how are they keeping their needles. Um, are there any complaints with department, local county health departments uh, or um, sort of those, have there been other complaints so maybe we can pull other complaints to see is this the patient. So there are ways and we do get those general complaints and sometimes they don't lead anywhere but we still will investigate them. Every complaint that comes in is looked at at some level to determine if there's a basis there to investigate. Um, and part of the role as the lead pro prosecutor uh, for each of the district office, there's there's one set for each one all over the state, is to look at some of those legal issues. Like someone files a complaint and says, well, you know, 10 years ago this doctor did this to me. Well, th is that within the statute of limitations? Can we still access those records? Um, looking at some of those legal issues to see is there even a legal case to start with before all this time and resources are expended on an investigation. Um, so th some of those determinations are made early. Um, but if we work together as a team at that in our sh uh, early stage, sometimes we have better results in getting where we need to go. How do you handle anonymous complaints? Yeah, it's, again, generally starting with the physician, looking at cures reports, looking at, um, and the nature of the complaint. I mean, if it's, so looking at what those resources relate to that complaint and out there in the public, uh, in the government sphere that we have. So if it's, you know, looking at the county resources, um, and we make our best attempt. But it can be difficult when it's patient issues, but we don't have a patient name. There are some tricks, uh, some methods, I wouldn't call them tricks, that investigators can use to perhaps identify patients, it, and it may not be the one from the anonymous complaint. Um, but there are ways, you know, looking at prescribing records and things like that for time periods. And Do you take anonymous complaints equally serious as, uh, really? Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, <clears throat> one, one very important tool that I think that uh, Emily was able to show you how you bridge the gap between civil and criminal. Um, so there's a quasi-criminal aspect to your public protection role, uh, which comes from the state government, and it's a very, very strong role. And one of the most um, impactful things that are available to you as a healthcare oversight agency armed with the powers to investigate um, anonymous complaints, uh, for example, is that you, we can always bring in the subject. Uh, the, the physician will, and the podiatrist will be brought in for an opportunity. They get a couple of opportunities to respond to the board. Initially, when the complaint comes in, that they're given a chance to explain things. They obviously know you're looking at them because if we do know patient um, identities, then we'll be requesting medical records. We may be um, looking at their 
uh, fictitious name permits, uh, looking at who they hire, see who their uh, compatriots are in their medical group. But at some point, once we've collected enough evidence, we will always, before we close the investigation, have a meaningful discussion on whether or not it's worth the time to take this practitioner out of their very busy practice, away from their patients, to come in for what is an understandably stressful environment and a stressful interview with their medical uh, licensing agency. But at that point, uh, we may just say, well, tell us exactly how you handle your needles in your office. Uh, who's your purveyor? What do you do? Who are your staff members? And at that point, a medical consultant should be sitting in on that uh, interview. And we really, truly rely on the medical consultant who is a podiatrist in his or her own practice, and they will be able to filter through whether what they're explaining to us makes sense within the standard practice or if it's an incompetence issue. Um, anonymous complaints are taken very seriously. Obviously, um, sometimes there are complaints that, that are not real complaints. Maybe they, they're misdirected to this board and, and we'll send them to their, their next available person that can listen to it. Sometimes there's a market issue that we don't get involved in. We only deal with um, patients and patient harm. So if somebody files a complaint saying, hey, this guy's my competitor and he's undercutting me, that's the type of thing that we probably would not look at um, ever. I think um, Brian would just um, keep it. Um, I, don't, I don't know what you would do with it, but, but, uh, but this would not be brought into our orbit, I don't believe. And the other portion with the, the quasi-criminal role is that the investigators can also work with local district attorney's offices and their investigative staff. So, um, you know, if they're billing and Medicare or uh, uh, insurance fraud issues, those are obviously criminal issues sometimes. Uh, and so you can work with district attorney's offices and their subpoena power. You, the board also has its own subpoena power, but DA's offices have some different uh, subpoena powers that um, they can do, you know, surreptitious recordings and things like that search warrants. Um, so the, the, the investigators very commonly work with local law enforcement to help develop some of those complaints. And anonymous, I mean, anonymous complaints happen all the time. So, um, and sometimes they are start anonymous and halfway through we find out who they are. We figure, we're able to piece it together in various ways. So, Part of this is also knowing what is our burden of proof and what we have to get, have to show to you to get that discipline. Um, and it's who, who has that burden? Generally, it's uh, the board has the burden to show uh, by clear and convincing evidence in accusation cases uh, that that level of discipline exists. Uh, and statement of issues cases, however, when an applicant is trying to show that they should get a license, they're the one that has the burden of proof. Um, or a petition for reinstatement to say, I, get my I should get my license back. It's up to that licensee or prospective licensee to show why they are entitled to that. Um, the burden of proof is also slightly different uh, for an administrative case seeking uh, to discipline a license. It's again that clear and convincing evidence standard versus a probation violation, uh, which we've already established that the licensee has been disciplined. They're on probation for uh, unprofessional conduct. So we only have to show by a preponderance of the evidence that that violation of their probation has ha uh, occurred. So it's a little, it's much easier for us. And it's one of the things that uh, it's when they do happen, we try and get these petition to revoke probation cases processed very quickly. Because sometimes, you know, if a probation case is uh, a period is three years long, we don't want to take two years to investigate and get it to hearing. We want to get it through as quickly as we can. Because um, that, again, is showing that so far rehabilitation is not working if the licensee is already committing violations. This is just sort of, again, a, a little slideshow of what that, just the overview of the disciplinary process and all those steps that we've discussed. There is one that I haven't mentioned, which is the default, uh, uh, default process. So when we file an accusation against a licensee, 
they have 15 days from the service of that to uh, file what we call a notice of defense. And that uh, says, I want a hearing and I want to go forward. If they make no response, um, the board has the ability to take a, a, a what we call a default, to essentially revoke their license um, without having a, a formal hearing process. We still have certain documents and things that we present to the board when it makes the consideration on those defaults. Um, they can also, if they fail to show at hearing, they've requested the process, but then decide for whatever reason not to show, we can then take a default on the license and revoke it at that point. Um, when a case is set for hearing, um, there are often settlement discussions that occur. Uh, hearings that are shorter than three days don't have a formal settlement hearing, uh, settlement conference with an ALJ. Cases longer than that do, so we will have an opportunity to meet with the uh, an administrative law judge and the other side and sort of hash out settlements. Um, and I, uh, most, well, I wouldn't say most, but a majority of cases resolved by settlement. Um, so that's an, another process that within the scope of the hearing. Um, once the hearing happens, the administrative law judge has 30 days to make the proposed findings of uh, fact and a recommendation to you folks. And then you've got your period of time, which I believe is 100 days, um, to make your either decision to adopt it, not adopt it, ask for more time, um, and get that final decision out. And once your final decision is issued, then that's when the writ process, or essentially an appeal process, begins for the licensee. And throughout all of this, obviously, we have lots of different players. We have the board members. We have the executive director who serves as the complainant for our accusations and uh, petitions to revoke probation. So Brian is on the hook for all of these complaints, the, the accusations get filed, it's his name on all of them, acting on behalf of the board. DCA legal counsel often is involved. Um, perhaps uh, we often have discussions regularly on statement of issues or licensing applications. So if there are questions about is there sufficient basis to deny this ap application, we will work with the attorney in our office, with DCA legal and the executive office to discuss is this an appropriate uh, application to approve or deny. Um, before that um, comes to the board. Um, you get to make your decisions uh, as the board members. Uh, our office is also involved to provide any legal advice that you may need on the legal portion, the, the administrative portion, whereas DCA's role is, is different uh, in, that, uh, in their capacity. You've also got the administrative law judge's role to sort of make those findings of fact and that uh, the procedure of the hearing and then we've got the licensee and they have the right to have counsel at uh, any stage of this proceeding as well so as board members one of the roles is to make sure that this process is fair are is due process being provided to the licensees and that is a role that the Attorney General's office is hopefully helping out and uh, advising and doing uh, with the board along the way. Um, however, as board members, because you are the deciders, you can't get involved in making any decisions in the investigation process, the hearing process, or the negotiation process. And that's part of the reason why uh, Mr. Nasland is on the complaint, so that we can have those discussions with him as the executive officer. Uh, beforehand, so we have independent decisions being made um, by the executive officer. We've got DCA legal making their independent advice on issues that are related to their concerns. And then we've got the Attorney General's office looking at legal issues uh, for our, our, our purposes, and all of we all work together so that when it comes to you folks, you can make the final decision and you're not involved in that independent initial process. Um, and I, I also, one thing to note that I, um, because you're all podiatrists, well, the, the board members that are podiatrists, 
I imagine it's very difficult to try and not insert yourselves in standard of care issues because you all practice in this area. Well, the, and, and so we have, that's why we hire the medical consultants and we have the experts so that they're involved in knowing the, the full details and getting in there and making those decisions about standard of care and the violations. Um, and your role, though, is not to uh, subsume that expert's role and reassert what you believe is the standard of care because then you've now inserted yourself back into that investigation and administrative process. Um, and I would imagine it's very difficult to look at another podiatrist's care and uh, an opinion and not want to also say, well, this is how I would have done it. And, but it is a, a role that you have as board members to take uh, independently uh, and on your own without um, inserting your own expertise, if you will. And overall, this is the sort of everything that we've talked about. Here's your flow chart. You can see it's fairly complicated. There's lots of little steps. Um, I think Gloria had some additional issues on this or discussion on this. Well, um, do you have any specific questions on Emily's um, presentation? Um, I just wanted to um, thank you for inviting us to explain this process. I know it can be very overwhelming to see this flowchart. Um, I just want you to take the takeaway from this is that there's a lot of very detailed steps. Um, obviously, every single case is uh, examined on its own merits and with its own expert, and it's on its on its own facts. Um, the standard of practice is evolving. We want to reward uh, medicine to move forward. Um, and obviously, uh, whatever standard of practice applied at the time to that patient needs to be really examined very carefully for the evidence that we need. Without evidence, there is no filing. Without any filing, there's no public protection. So that whole gray part of this flowchart represents our teamwork with the Health Quality Investigation Unit and all 52 deputies in my office and all 12 lead prosecutors that are located throughout the state and making sure that this evidence gathering process is fair, that it's not biased, that it takes into account every side of the story um, and arms you with enough confidence that when we file an accusation and really put one of your folks' names out there in front of patients, that we have taken due regard that this meets our filing standards for the Javier Brasilla's office, that it carries his name as well, that it meets our burden of proof, which is clear and convincing to a reasonable certainty. And again, it's very, very high. And why is it high? Because folks go to school for many, many years. This is a property interest. You um, did uh, your residencies, you, you maintain your, your courses, and you want to maintain the quality of your profession. So um, we're just very, very committed to you. Um, and rest assured that anything that the Attorney General controls independently, such as when we receive a case for filing, we're trying to file it as soon as possible. Why? Because once we have a case and we have this evidence, we believe it's very, very important to put the public on notice that there's an issue with this practitioner. Um, as Emily explained, um, at the very, very top of the process, when the investigation is received at the district office, um, our lead prosecutors, like Emily, are, are the finest individuals in our office. They have the most experience, and they can see a case um, from a mile away that is going to present issues, um, that is either going to present um, problems with trying to get medical records, or that present um, high urgency topics such, such as sexual abuse, um, self-medicating uh, prescribers, uh, dangerous practices, and outright incompetence. Um, we really, really believe in the process. Um, each of these um, little markers are maintained in uh, what we have a, as a case management system, it's called PROLA. We uh, bill for our different tasks, and um, we believe that we provide an excellent, excellent service. And at the very end, on the lower right-hand side, um, that's you folks. Uh, that The green uh, little boxes on the right-hand side uh, represent um, ultimately the most important thing, which is what when you put your imprimatur of uh, what the disciplinary outcome should be. Can this person be rehabilitated or not? We all understand that it's not supposed to be punitive in nature. 
and that um, we don't really look at harm. We, what we look at is, can this person be salvaged? Are they worthy of probation? And that's great. Or something less than that, and we discuss public approvals and public letters of reprimand. Or should they be revoked? And as we all know, um, revocation is only valid for about three years, and after three years, the, these folks can come back uh, on a petition for reinstatement um, and ask for their license back. Um, as well as uh, on really, really long probationary terms, they can come in and try and modify probation. They can try and prove to you that they have been rehabilitated, there's no public purpose being served by having them on probation. Um, a, a practitioner who is on probation is, is, is disabled in certain respects, obviously, um, because of not only the fact that they have to be reporting to probation, but they're trying to rehabilitate themselves while trying to move their practice forward. So we handle those things on your behalf too, and we take great care to assign the same deputy attorney general, more than likely the one that managed the investigation, put the person on probation, and knows the most facts about the case. And um, in those particular petitions, uh, we wear a different hat. Um, the attorney general is actually stepping in the role, even though you you pay for our billing, billables, we're actually at that point advocating for the public interest and if the attorney general doesn't feel that or doesn't believe that somebody should be given another chance to come back in we will argue very strenuously that they should be left out of practice and allowed to come back in three more years once they've shown more rehabilitation but sometimes we actually agree i mean we will we'll say okay you know this person actually did everything they were supposed to do and um, sometimes very rarely uh, we do join and the request for a termination of probation. Um, the health quality enforcement section is uh, determined by statute. Um, you're one of four uh, healthcare oversight agencies that are specifically our clients in, in uh, the Attorney General's office. We hold a unique position uh, because really the only law firm that's mentioned in the government code at the Attorney General's office, and we're privileged in assisting you in maintaining the high standards of your profession. And um, with that, um, I wanted to conclude my remarks and ask you if you have any questions or comments for, for Emily. I know the chart's overwhelming, <laughs> but if, if you have a chance to look at it, you'll understand why, quote unquote, it takes so long sometimes to complete I, I don't know if you're gonna answer these questions, but how often does one of the boards in the DCA um, not adopt your recommendation? Uh, it happens uh, with, with some, yeah, it happens. Um, there are, I think that training opportunities like this are immensely helpful. Um, but sometimes board members, when you want to take a vote, um, depending on what your quorum is like, if a decision is held, we are more than happy to come in and explain to you why we believe the p penalty is appropriate or uh, why we agree with you that the penalty that was rendered was not appropriate. You can not adopt um, an ALJ, an administrative law judge's um, recommendation after hearing. And as Emily pointed out, we work very closely with board staff and Mr. Noslin to try and come up with a settlement agreement that is within your disciplinary guidelines. But that is your role. If you feel that uh, what we're recommending does not fall within your disciplinary guidelines or that we haven't explained to you why a deviation is necessary or why we're um, focused on something uh, and we haven't explained it well in our stipulation recommendation letter, uh, we welcome the opportunity to come in and speak with you. Uh, we try to be as uniform as possible statewide, um, but given the fact that there's no precedential value to, well, there are very few precedential decisions. Uh, the boards can um, and do uh, deem precedential decisions every once in a while, but since everything's rendered on their own merits, with their own expert, with their own facts, um, we can get we we try not to get it wrong, but we try to present you with the facts that we think you need, and we respectfully come in. If we do ask for reduced penalties, are there any hard feelings? No, no. Um, ultimately, we, we, we exist to serve the, the, the board, and I believe that the compositions of these boards, these healthcare oversight agencies, are so important. We need the expertise 
of, of the folks who are the market participants, who are podiatrists. And then we also need public members that, that actually are licensed sometimes in their own right, so they get it, like we get it, we're licensed professionals as well. And um, together, when you vote on these um, issues with the facts that you're presented, um, you will always come to the right decision for that person. And here's the thing, and, and if somebody disagrees with you, the respondent in particular, this podiatrist, they have so much due process left. And I, in passing, we mentioned writs. Uh, they have the ability to go into superior court and explain to a superior court judge, and they do from time to time. It's, it's very time consuming and we represent you there as well. And if they convince a superior court judge that you got it wrong, uh, that you acted arbitrarily, capricious, that you just, you know, uh, you relied on a fact that was not there, and that would be very shocking to us because that we live in the facts, we live in the evidence, but basically it's a house that's built on a foundation. If they tack any part of it, they say the facts weren't there and the holdings weren't um, up upholding the conclusions and the outcome, we go in, and it can take quite a while um, to resolve that in a writ, but I'd like to say that we win most, if not all of them, and very few of them are remanded. Um, in the past three years, we did have one that was remanded um, in my re recollection, and all that happens at that point is it comes back to the board, and you are still the only one, the, the Superior Court can't do it for you. All they can say is you got it wrong, and you still get another bite at the apple. So if they say, um, Superior Court says, take out this fact, it didn't exist, take out this holding and this conclusion of law, and come to another determination. The whole case comes back to you. Someone like Emily, or, or whoever was the dad that, that, that managed the case will, will come in and explain to you, well, this is what happened, and these are your choices. Um, that's where, um, actually, we, we rely quite a bit on DCA counsel. Um, they understand exactly what happened, and they'll tell you your choices. They could say, well, you could issue a different penalty, you could dismiss it, you could uh, go back to hearing and collect more evidence. It ultimately is always going to be your decision. Um, you're the only folks that have the authority over the license. No one else. The criminal court does it, the superior court does it. All they can do is measure your uh, holding to make sure it complied with due process and that it's colorable under law and that you didn't abuse it. I have a question that's slightly tangential to enforcement, but it has to do with cost recovery. Mm -hmm. Specifically on a revocation case which is not stayed, most of the time I just see it as a revocation and there isn't an attempt for cost recovery. And how often do we actually pursue that? Um, so there's two questions there. Um, number one, we always put in a declaration of costs um, to try and recover your investigative costs and your attorney uh, general costs. Um, and that only applies for accusations. For statement of issues, that's completely different. There's no cost there. Um, and, and only up until the moment the hearing starts. That's right, that's right, correct. And so um, we will um, make an argument to the ALJ, the administrative law judge, that you're entitled to 100% recovery. Um, please know that I, in my per personal capacity as senior assistant of the Health Quality Enforcement Section, um, do meet on a regular basis with the Office of Administrative Hearings to try and strive for a better presentation of evidence to make sure that our clients are getting their costs, that um, my dads, my deputies, are presenting the judges with the proper forms, with the proper explanations. We're the cheapest game in town. I mean, we charge $170 an hour. If we were a private law firm, I mean, I think our value is very, very high, but sometimes ALJs disagree with, uh, with us. They think um, that perhaps the podiatrist has put forward enough evidence to say that maybe they have a child support order or they just have a lot of other obligations such that they can't pay you. And they will reduce your award. Um, we see that quite a bit. Uh, we're working um, much more closely with all of our deputies to make sure that we're making a meaningful presentation. But these are all filed in the Declaration of Penalty of Perjury by my staff. Um, I don't know how else to explain that these are the proper and reasonable costs of prosecution and investigation. And unfortunately, um, like I said, ALJs will, because they're independent, reduce the costs. And then ultimately when it comes to you, 
um, back in my other life when I worked in the Civil Rights Enforcement Section, I represented the Department of Fair Employment and Housing. We did a lot of collection of, of costs. Uh, but at that point, it's really up to the board. Um, we have seen executive officers enter into payment plans. Um, specifically, when people surrender their licenses, sometimes we can come into an agreement that they pay less cost if they go away because it's a savings. Other times, they agree to pay if they ever come back. And again, at that point, I don't know about interest. I don't know about capitalizing, you know, like the, the, the time that it took to collect that. But it is an issue that I think is very important because I believe that it goes back into your budget and it allows you to continue your work, whatever money that is. And even though it's licensing fees, licensing fees from your constituents, it, it's still public money that should go back into enforcement or whatever else um, is the mission um, of, of, of the board um, to educate and, and to empower consumers. More frequently, what I've seen is the ALJ, the goal is to protect the public, mm -hmm. and revocation of the license protects the public. Yes. After which they don't feel the collection of the, the, the investigation cost is now required. Mm -hmm. Justice has been served, you protect the public. The ALJ can, there's no prohibition against the ALJ actually ordering those, revoc those cost recovery amounts with a revocation. Um, I think maybe it's more of a, a side effect of the ALJ simply feeling bad that now they've lost their ability to pay. They have no form of income if they've lost their license. So I think that's kind of where on revocation cases why you might see ALJs just decide, well, they lost their license so we're not going to order them to pay. But there's nothing that prohibits them from ordering that cost recovery. Okay. Um, and then the board taking the appropriate actions, even with the license that's been revoked, to enforce those costs and get them back. And, uh, and actually, this is a legislative change that I would um, recommend uh, that you might want to look at more closely. I think it's a struggle for all of our clients. It's not just this board. And um, it, it, it's a measure of explaining to the ALJs, perhaps, as a board, meeting with uh, Judge Morazzini, explaining what you do with that cost, it, uh, explaining um, what it is that you do and why it's important to this board to recover those costs, why it shouldn't be a gift uh, back to the respondent, even though they are independent um, of you and, and can do this. Uh, but the legislative change is that you are really hobbled. The only thing you can not adopt is, you know, kind of a penalty, but, but you cannot not adopt to undo the, the non-award of costs. That's a legislative change, um, and I think that there is absolutely no, nothing in the horizon that I see that is going to increase the costs, uh, uh, the hourly costs for investigators or the hourly costs of attorney generals. In fact, our hourly rate has not increased for 10 years. So I I don't even know if that's like a, mar a fund analysis or whatever, but again, it, it's, it's, it's uh, subs this whole process is subsidized by good practitioners to be able to look at the bad practitioners or at least examine them and, and, and bring them to justice or close the investigation because there's nothing fruitful. Um, it's all a good process, but it should come back to you. I, I, we feel very strongly and we take it as a loss. We don't like to not get you your costs. We take it, we don't take it, we don't like it. I will say Dr. Uh, Weybridge wrote a very good article for your newsletter, your most recent newsletter, about how physicians, podiatrists can work with the board and make this process a little less intimidating, scary, and get it done. So it was a very good article by him. Thank you. All right, thank you both thank very you. much for your presentation. Very valuable. And are there lights? So I'd like to um, see if there's any reason why we can't call a lunch break. So 30 minutes, we'll start again at 1.15. Thank you all.
It was a great lunch, and it's time to get back into business. Uh, the first order of business this afternoon will be a presentation from the Department of Consumer Affairs. We have Christopher Castrillo and several, a couple other friends. He'll introduce uh, them. Our gang, yeah. Your gang, your posse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Happy to be here on a Friday. Happy Friday to everybody. Um, as mentioned, I'm Chris Castrillo, the new Deputy Director for Board and Bureau Services here uh, at the Department of Consumer Affairs. Uh, two months in, I've had the opportunity to meet uh, your Executive Director, Mr. Nasland, and again, appreciate the opportunity to provide an update here uh, to the Board from the Department of Consumer Affairs. Uh, a little bit about myself. I come to DCA with a background in public policy and campaign management having most recently worked as a legislative advocate uh, where I covered a variety of policy areas including labor, higher education, youth mental health, foster care, uh, and local government to name a few. Uh, I also have worked on candidate and initiative campaigns in both California and, and, and Oregon. Uh, new to the DCA family, new to state service, uh, greatly looking forward to applying my experience and skill set, however, to establishing an office of Board and Bureau Services that implements the goals laid out in our strategic plan, exemplifies organizational effectiveness, and provides relevant, timely, and accurate information to all of our stakeholders. Uh, also, as a way of introduction, my first update will be to report some staffing changes at the department. Uh, my predecessor, Ms. Christine Lawley, who previously served as the Deputy Director for Board and Bureau Relations, uh, has joined the Medical Board of California as its Deputy Director. Uh, while the department is sad to see Ms. Lolly go, we know she'll do great things uh, at the Medical Board and we wish her the best in her new position. Uh, additionally, the department has a couple of other uh, new faces on our executive team. Uh, we welcomed a new Chief Deputy Director, Chris Schultz, uh, and a new Deputy Director of Administration, Natalie Daniel. Uh, before coming to DCA, Mr. Schultz has been the Deputy Commissioner of Community Programs and Policy Initiatives at the California Department of Insurance since 2011. Ms. Daniel has been a Fiscal Supervisor at the Judicial Council of California since 2015, and she'll be overseeing the Department's Office of Human Resource Resources, Business Services Office, and Fiscal Operations. Uh, also some exciting changes at the Office of Board and Bureau Services. Uh, the department has reallocated available resources to increase staffing for Board and Bureau Services. These new resources will expand on the services that we are able to provide, including assistance on and across all licensing and enforcement issues, facilitating intergovernment communication, providing board member and executive officer administrative and technical support, and executing the department's strategic plan. Uh, so with that, we uh, noticed the uh, individuals that were here with me today. I would like to welcome um, our two new assistant deputy directors, uh, Karen Nelson and Patrick Lee, out there in the audience. You could give them a, a warm welcome. Uh, Karen has been the chief operations officer at the American uh, Leadership Forum Mountain Valley Chapter since 2014. Uh, and Mr. Lee has been the uh, assistant chief of external affairs at Covered California since 2015. They are. Uh, a month into their tenure at the Department of Consumer Affairs. Been absolutely delighted to have them aboard, and we're really uh, gelling as a team. We look forward to working with the board, and of course, all the boards across DCA. Um, the department is confident these staff additions will strengthen our ability to pursue the department's mission and the services we are able to provide our various boards and bureaus. A um, couple of other items that are um, non-new face related. In September, the department held its second director's quarterly meeting with board executive officers. Uh, these quarterly meetings are an opportunity um, to ensure the department continues an open dialogue with its boards and bureaus. To that end, we will also be holding an annual meeting, a uh, date yet to be determined with uh, Director Grafilo um, to ensure that he's available to you and he can hear feedback from board leadership on the important issues facing the department uh, and again in the various boards and bureaus. Uh, DCA released a new online search for the programs using the Breeze platform. Uh, the license search will expand current functionality and allow the public to conduct more flexible inquiries. This new DCA search brings our offering closer to the familiar search capabilities common across the internet, allowing our stakeholders to access the important data they require at their fingertips. A uh, quick note on leadership training. The department officially launched its new future leadership development training program in May 2017 and held the kickoff 
off uh, with program participants and mentors in August of 2017. The last meeting of the future leadership development participants was this past October and featured Senator Jerry Hill. Uh, this uh, leadership development program expands on the department's current, current leadership academy training. Uh, the department is looking to develop the best and brightest amongst its boards and bureaus uh, into its future leaders. The program includes executive mentoring, customized leadership training, project management. I've had the opportunity to sit in on a couple and I think it's a fantastic program. Comes highly recommended to, to any of your staff looking to get involved. Uh, quick note on pro rata. The department has established a pro rata work group of DCA and board executives to discuss potential improvements on how the department communicates these issues across its boards and bureaus. Um, and as you know, pro rata is the process by which the department distributes the costs amongst its boards and bureaus to cover all of the departmental services which we provide, such as information technology, legal, publication services, comms, legislative review, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the work group held its first meeting in August 2017. We actually had our third meeting at DCA headquarters today. Um, and the department also hosted a pro rata open house this past November, again, to provide information on pro rata and to give an opportunity for board and bureau leadership um, to meet our various departments and learn a little bit more about uh, what we do and what we provide to, to the various boards and bureaus. Um, couple of quick items on board member training. Just want to remind folks that 2017 is a mandatory sexual harassment prevention training year for the Department of Consumer Affairs. This means uh, all employees and board members are required to complete this training in 2017, even if it was completed last year. Uh, the training is online, interactive, and can, can be completed at your convenience. Um, just note that we are here at December 1, 2017, so we've got about a month left in case uh, we have any board members who have not had the opportunity to do that yet. Uh, if you have any questions about this or any of the other required trainings during your tenure as a board member, please do not hesitate to contact the Office of Board and Bureau Services for your assistance. I had the opportunity of doing our first uh, board member orientation training this past month. We'll be getting together and setting the dates for 2018 here shortly, and we'll be, be sure to provide those to you as well. Um, just want to make sure you all know the department is committed to serving its boards and bureaus. Um, as you know, much of the consumer protection value that is done through the department comes from boards such as the Board of Podiatric Medicine. Uh, we always work, we always protect consumers better when we are working together, so I'd like to thank you for that. Um, and as always, if the department can be of service to the board, please don't hesitate to let myself, um, either of our deputies know, or any of your contacts uh, at the department. We're here to, to help you uh, serve the the consumers of California. Um, with that, thank you for your diligent work and your value partnership. I look forward to the opportunity to working with you all during my tenure. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you again. Okay, thank you so much. I just want to say thanks, Chris, Pat, and Karen. Welcome aboard. <coughs> look forward to working with you guys. Thank you. Appreciate having us. All right. <coughs> Next, we're going to move into the executive officer's reports. Mr. Nesland. Okay, we'll jump right into it. We have a licensing uh, program with Andrea. Good afternoon. We will begin with the new licenses issued during quarter one of fiscal year 17-18. In July, there were 11 permanent licenses issued. In August, there were seven. In September, there was one for a total of 19 newly licensed DPMs for quarter one. <coughs> there are 33 pending applications with four candidates that have recently completed their packages. Uh, per the board's request, a breeze report was compiled by OIS to indicate the number of female and male DPMs the, PPM, the BPM has in the current status. Out of 2,200 active records, approximately 35% are registered as female, while 65% are registered as male. Records are incomplete as the gender field is voluntary information and not required to complete the application. Moving on to renewal. Data in the month of July, 106 renewals were mailed with 97 renewed by end of month. August had 101 renewals mailed with 99 renewed by end of month. And September had 96 renewals mailed with 92 renewed by the end of month. Delinquent renewal notices were mailed to those that did not comply with renewal requirements 30 days after expiration. Next is the resident data. 
Uh, BPM currently has 121 residents and the resident data now includes the number of third year residents that currently hold or are applying for a permanent license on attachment C. Next we have a Breeze system update for online renewals. There was an issue with the system accepting payments via American Express, but the BPM worked closely with our developers to resolve the issues right away. To date, no new issues have arisen and online license renewals is running smoothly. As of November, there are 89 DPMs that renewed online and we anticipate this number to rise as more users register their Breeze account. Finally, we have a continuing education CME audit. The CME audit is currently in process for 25 randomly selected licensees with an expiration date of December 31st. Licensees were mailed along with their renewals and audit notification on October 5th. All candidates selected were given a deadline date of December 31st to submit evidence of compliance. And as of November 30th, 13 have been found in compliance and one has filed for retired status. A reminder, reminder notice was mailed to those who have not yet submitted evidence on November 14th and staff awaits further CME documentation and will provide a more thorough report at the March board meeting. Any questions? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Andre. Thank you. Good job. And Dr. Manstorff, do you want to do a recap on enforcement? Sure, thank you. Uh, I won't go through all the specifics, just uh, highlighting some of the, the fine deep, uh, go over a few highlights of the uh, enforcement report as, as submitted. Uh, you might have seen some of the complaint data has gone up uh, recently. I don't necessarily think this is a trend. We seem to have some ebbs and flows in terms of complaints. So we'll just follow that. It seems to also be dependent upon the economy. Uh, investigation data, disciplinary data, and the enforcement statistics. When you look at our metrics, they've actually, they're actually outstanding, some of the best they've been in years, and it continues to improve. And uh, we're following right along with Medical Board on that in terms of our numbers. In fact, um, one of the things we had requested of staff was to look at where our metrics are relative to the other boards. And you can see that on attachment G. And when you look at comparable boards, whether it's Osteopathy Board or Medical Board of California, our numbers are right in line with them. In fact, in some cases, better. And had we the, had we the option to change some of our metrics comparable to the Osteopathic Board, we'd actually be looking quite good. Getting back to uh, Attorney General cases, currently we have 12 cases that are pending. One was our, uh, already adjudicated and signed off. We completed four today, so we really only have seven cases pending with the Attorney General's office, and that's probably the lowest we've been in a while. Uh, DCA performance measures, just as I was mentioning before, our metrics are actually quite good, and hopefully we'll continue to see that improve. For cost recovery, we're a little behind on cost recoupment as our billing went out late. It went out second quarter rather than first quarter, so we should see those numbers improve. Uh, consultant expert in training, we're still trying to work with SOLID and hope that they'll put together an expert uh, and consultant training program. It really would be helpful. And um, I don't know whether we had our consultants that made it to the MBC meeting on November 2nd. That I'm not aware of. Yeah. Uh, lastly, the evaluation of consultants and experts. We had some discussion. Uh, we didn't have a quorum for our subcommittee, but uh, discussion with staff regarding what to do with the evaluation forms of the consultants and experts. And we're still trying to figure out the best, best practice to determine what to do with that information. Uh, most likely it would stay within the, uh, the enforcement committee for review, and if there is a concern with one of our reviewers or experts that uh, may come to uh, greater con uh, consideration before the board, but much of the time it, it's not appropriate to bring it up uh, in public session. So it, it would be evaluated in the subcommittee. 
to determine whether an expert or consultant should be reviewing for the board. That's all that I have. Any questions? Thank you, Neil. Okay. Thank you, Neil. We have Kathy. Flurry of reports by Kathleen. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kathleen Cooper, and I'm going to present uh, three reports to you right now in, in order of, that's on the agenda. I'm going to start with the legislative report. So um, that's part A of my legislative <coughs> report in your agenda, 10C. And um, we're so pleased to say that AB 1153 passed as expected. Um, that was something that you had voted to support. And Assembly Lowe's bill, just to summarize once again, it creates a scope change in the Business and Professions Code for Section 2472. And it reflects uh, the recognition that the podiatric surgeon's role in ul ulcer and wound care of the lower limb uh, cannot be denied, and um, that you're the go-to profession for um, being called in on those type of cases. And we'd like to congratulate uh, John Holtman and CPMA and Dr. Chisholm and others who worked on that along with uh, Assemblyman Lowe. Uh, we don't expect too many changes other than the fact that uh, when the scope questions come in, we'll be answering them differently now, and um, we're very excited about that, to have that clarity that we didn't have before. Any questions on 1153? It was a big success. Um, the other bill that is so important to this board is SB 798. BPM also supported SB 798, and once again, that's Senator Hill's bill, which extends the operation of the Medical Board of California and the Osteopathic Medical Board of California to 2022. And what being removed from the Medical Board in, in SB 798 will create a third Medical Board, and that will be the Board of Podiatric Medicine, unless there's a name change, which I'll talk about in Section C of my report to come up shortly. But um, right now we are, as of January 1st, 2018, expecting to be conducting our business separately from the medical board. And our current name, the, the Board of Podiatric Medicine, will hopefully be changed somehow to include the word California, because now that we're not under their jurisdiction, there's no recognition of what we really are. We could be a national federation or an association. It doesn't really recognize the California regulatory status of this board unless there is a name change. Um, so that name change will probably be done under Brian Naslin's uh, direction in 2018 in terms of introducing legislation or having it included in some type of bill that already exists for the health care uh, boards. Any questions about 798? Yes, SB 547 is the third successful bill that was passed. And the Board of Podiatric Medicine has not had its unscheduled fees, which is not the renewal fee, it's everything else, um, since the late 80s. So we were due, and we've been given authority to up those uh, fees in a reasonable manner, and that will be a regulatory process. So the legislative part had to happen first, and it's according to Business and Professions Code 2499.5, if you'd like to look at our fees. But we will be presenting the item to you probably in March so that you can approve it and then we could go forward with the regulatory process. Um, as far as regulatory updates, the disciplinary guidelines that we've been using to do the review you did today in closed session was approved in 2006. And staff at the board, uh, basically uh, Ms. DeAngelis, myself, and, and Mr. Naslin, we've been working hard to update that, and we've been using our existing 2006 version with the successful medical board version that was approved last year. So we expect that legal counsel will be looking at that before the next board meeting, and we'll be able to present that to you. It's not all that different, but it does include some new things. So we'll be presenting that to you in March. And fully lay it out for you so you can have your input. We'll be asking for input from the DAG and also from counsel that is provided to us by DCA. And um, the last regulatory matter I've already mentioned, it'll be the unscheduled fees that need to be presented in a regulatory fashion to get those fees in place. 
we're not expecting any fee increases until at least 2019. And those type of fees, just in case you're wondering, are like <clears throat> the duplicate license fee or an extra wall certificate, little things like that. And uh, those fees don't cover the cost of what it costs this agency to produce. So we're just not trying to increase it out of line with what it actually costs. Um, last but not least, I'll just mention it because it's in my report, is su subsection C is the name change. And uh, the one that we hope uh, will be established, and there'll be an item for you on this in March as well, would be to stay in line with the Medical Board of California, the Osteopathic Medical Board of California, something along the lines of the Podiatric Medical Board of California. So it would be PMBC. And um, if you have some other suggestions, I think this has been talked about, but until we see the actual uh, item before you and you could discuss it, it we're, we're going along as if it would be something PMBC, Podiatric Medical Board of California. So before we go any further, let's have a discussion with the board about this and a possible motion in action. So Dr. Zaff, do you want to strike up a conversation about the uh, name change? To be consistent with the other two medical boards and to indicate that we are on par with the other two medical boards, it seems like a very appropriate name change. Are there any comments or, or other thoughts or objections? just want to go on the record as saying that um, CPMA is fully supportive of this name change. And then can we put on the record, Dr. Zaff, what that name change would be and what type the of The name change would be called the Podiatric Medical Board of California, PMBC. And perhaps we could use a motion to... I'll make a motion to initiate legislation to pursue a name change of the Board of Podiatric Medicine to the California Medical Board of Cal or California Podiatric Medical no, Podiatric, Podiatric Medical, Medical Board, Board of California. Of California. Thank you. <laughs> Is there a second? Oh, I second the motion. So, so let's uh, take a roll call vote. Uh, was there any public opinion? Oh. Michael Zaff, I. Neil Mansdorf, I. Judy Manby, I. Very good. We'll prepare the papers. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to close my legislative report to just tell you that we'll have updates as of March 2nd, the next board meeting, um, which will likely be in Southern California in 2018. I'm going to open up now the public education program report. We've separated these committees out. They were once joined, but they're separate now. And first I'll report on the board's website. So during the fiscal year 1617, which runs from July 1st to June 30th, uh, July 1st, 2016 to June 30th, 2017, our website had over 15,000 users. And the new users were 14,600. So you can see that the access to our website is increasing drastically. Um, the average user accessed the website 1.6 times. So some people are just coming once in a while and perhaps others are using a few more times, but people aren't going back regularly. It seems like out of the 65,000 page views we had, um, people only stayed on the website for about two minutes and 17 seconds, with an average of 4.3 pages viewed over those two minutes. The home page had 59,000 visits, and the most popular areas included people checking for licensees data, disciplinary updates, and the fact sheets were accessed, thirdly. There's different ways to get to different sites, but it looked like filing a complaint was in about the fourth or fifth position. And the consumer public document page, which includes all enforcement actions, uh, came next. Many applicants were searched, were, were searching on the website, to, and, and we have this year just started where you can renew your, your license, but applicants are going there too. 
Um, so that, that may be part of the reason that our, our website usage has gone up so much. Um, meetings were, were accessed to see when we're having our board meeting and where, and then also the contact us section, which usually re ends up with a, a query to, to the executive officer, to uh, staff about scope questions and other things like that. Most visitors came from those common search engines like Google, but the other areas where they came to us were from the Medical Board of California, the California Podiatric Medical Association, the Federation of Podiatry Medical Boards, the Department of Consumer Affairs, and the California Department of Healthcare Services. So people really are accessing our website. Um, I'll continue to monitor the website activity in the future and report to you next year at this time uh, as to how the last year went. Any questions on the website data? Yeah, actually, it was pointed out to us that our website's a little out of date in terms of board members and uh, new board members, expiration of terms, and what have you, if we can update that. Thank you. I will need to get some information, so I'll be in contact. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, I'll close that report, saying, too, that the next report will be in the March 2nd board meeting. The next agenda item is also mine, and it's the financial reporting. So I, I would just like to say, uh, the last meeting we heard from the DCA Budgets Office through Karen Munoz, and she was able to give you the data for how we stood at the end of the fiscal year. But we're awaiting a data transfer from this old program we used called CalSTARS to a new program that the state is using called FISCAL. And uh, we really don't have access to the data right now. Uh, we don't think there's any different expenditure or income levels than we've had consistently throughout many, many years. We, everything looks like it's going to be the same, but we just don't have the compilation of all the data to give you the report. I'm confident that by March we will be able to keep you apprised of the current expenditures and income. Um, I did include the fund condition because, as Karen said, I just wanted you all to be aware that the way it looks from the governor's point of view for our budget, like we might be getting in a little bit of, uh, our fund condition looks a little low. But we are given a little bit extra money every year to protect us so that we can fully enforce, and we're so small, fully enforce, we get a little bit extra money and it makes it look like we're at full expenditure of that budget. We're never at full expenditure of that budget. So in the past, when I first started, you would get two uh, fund condition reports. One would be the one we really expected it to be, and the other one would be how it looks with the extra in there in case we need it, which always reverts back to the state. It's not our money, but it's there if we need it for enforcement. If we do the calculations uh, as if we are not at full expenditure, we, we look fine. But I just want you to know publicly it looks as if we're spending over a million, a million five almost, or a million four, and we don't. We, we tend to stay within the 900, high 900s or low, uh, seven figures. So um, we just have to be aware of that, that that is an issue and um, our fund condition is not really as bad as it looks on there. Any questions about the fund condition? So I'll add, um, I'll add this. It's a statewide problem right now with all state entities with this changeover of CalSTARS to FISCAL. Uh, my old department, departments, boards, cross State of California of an entity don't have the reports yet as, as since July. So as soon as we get those reports, we'll be able to update the information and get us a back up to status quo. I think our budget is at the same level of what was last year. Everything's fine is our best guess at this point. But it actually is a guess. It's not actual. So as soon as we get that information from Fiscal, we'll definitely update you. So I'll conclude my three reports unless there's any questions. I do have one to mention one thing here, the, the, um, the footnotes. Yeah, I wouldn't say that. Good job. Oh, great thank job. You. Thank really you. Yeah, I'd really like to thank Kathy and everybody who participated. Putting these things together is really difficult. It really is. It, it seems like so simple when you look at it. It looks so awesome. 
but is, is probably one of the hardest tasks that we have. And so thank you everybody for participating and, and you know, giving their words and putting together legal staff for reviewing. It's a big effort and it really, it really shows in this product because it's top notch. Makes us very proud to have that newsletter. And those students' articles were uh, very welcome. Yeah. And you know, it's made me think of it differently too. It is a great advertisement for the profession and also, you know, just a great source of information for a consumer. Mm -hmm. um, so I think from that perspective, you know, when you're trying to find something else to say in it or something, I think if we, I think the student angle was great. And, you know, we have um, residents that do a lot of um, these medical missions to um, Vietnam. Uh, our residents go there. Um, some go down to Mexico. But um, so we might want to highlight that in an upcoming one. I could get one of my residents to maybe contribute their experience. It's a great idea. Thank you. And we do have extra copies in the office. So if you feel free to take some back to your establishments, please do. Thank you. And finally in this section, the executive management report. Okay, uh, unfortunately we didn't have a meeting, a uh, committee meeting, so um, one of the topics I wanted to bring up is the uh, frequencies of board meetings and all committee meetings. In the past, this board met three times per year. At some, uh, at some point you went to four meetings per year. I'm looking at this as a little cost savings initiative. A board meeting probably runs us between 5,000, if that, maybe a little more. Um, if we skip one of the board meetings, could we use that money for outreach or other types of activities? So I just wanted to bring up the discussion, see what the board felt about possibly going back to three meetings per year or keeping it uh, consistent with the four that we have going on currently. Well, I, you know, some years, I haven't been on the board as long as some of the other members. However, my experience has been that sometimes it's like this whole flurry of activity. We had a very busy year. When we did the sunset, you know, stuff. And, you know, that, that was a very, uh, four meetings were probably needed. If not, you know, some of those meetings are really long. So I think that is something to take, to take into consideration. But on years that, you know, maybe that's not happening, I don't think having three meetings a year is such a bad idea. I think it's a good idea. I'd, I'd support that. Okay. Any other thoughts? I'm a little concerned in, in the sense that there's already a, when we're looking at cases and the time it takes to process cases, if we reduce the meetings to three, it's gonna add additional time to the review uh, from a point of view of the public. And, and so I'm a little concerned how that would be impacted by reducing the number of meetings. Now what we could do is we can go ahead and uh, through the Bagley King Act post that through teleconference closed session. If you feel comfortable, the board members feel comfortable um, engaging in phone conversations with everybody in legal counsel via telephone conference. And that would be as necessary when you have a hold. It would be a little unusual how many we had. I have to say that. That's the most I've ever seen us all mm -hmm. have to review it at one meeting. See, I, I find it's easier to discuss those cases in person, to look at, look at your faces and facial expressions and get a feeling of what's going that on. That does have huge value. Yeah. And I, I just can't imagine doing that with our constituents um, on the phone. It's such a, I mean, we, we took away, uh, well, not rephrase that, it's, we have the potential to take away someone's livelihood and that it just it seems so cold to do that without having the kind of discussion that being in person represents. And second, I think that having four meetings gives the public more access to us. Okay. Anybody else? So maybe somebody would like to make a motion to reduce it from four meetings to three? Or keep it the same? Well, make the motion one way or the other and then yeah. we'll vote on it. I motion that we keep it to four meetings a year. 
Is there a, I will second that. So, how do, how do we vote on that? Maria? Aye. Judy? And I vote aye. I think for the time being, let's keep it at for a year. Although I don't anticipate much going on this next year. Uh, three is probably reasonable. I think it, uh, <laughs> I voted for it. So. Okay, so it was three yes and one abstention. Okay, good enough. Yeah, I just wanted to have that conversation to see what the feeling was, and, and uh, I agree. Does that conclude your report? No, we have uh, one more item. Okay. And since it is December. So we're, we're at uh, nominations of board positions and committee appointments. In the committee appointments, I think there's an attachment back here somewhere that what is current, who's to who here. And where is that again? Under 11. So, Dr. Zaff. All right. Um, in the recent past, the president has served for two terms, but in the more distant past, it had been the tradition to serve one term. And I'm perfectly happy to allow someone else to participate as being president. And I'm also willing to serve again. But if somebody would like to do that, or somebody would like to nominate somebody to do that, I think that um, they'd be entertained. Oh, I'd like to nominate Michael to continue uh, as president of the board for next year. Can I do that? Is that what we're doing here? Right? I don't know how it goes. But I would second the nomination. In fact, I might uh, make the, uh, the, the motion to maintain the existing slate uh, and nominate the existing members, Dr. Zapp as continuing as president, Dr. Manzi as vice president, and Darlene Trujillo remaining as secretary. I'll second that. Okay. Or does the maker of the motion agree to change it? I agree to change that motion, yes. Okay. So the motion is to keep uh, the executive um, committee intact for next year. Executive board. Board, yes. Maria? Aye. Judy? Aye. Michael Zaffi? Neil Mansour, fine. Right. Now we have a second question. Okay, the second question is committees. Well, before that, you oh. we mentioned how difficult it was to have an executive meeting with one person being absent. Right. You might want to address that. Okay. Explain what the problem is. Okay, so the problem is, is an exec, we have three members that is... Uh, we have to follow the Bagley King Act and when one member is absent then we don't have a quorum and then we can't have the meeting but if we reduced it down to two members in the executive management then we could have the meeting because we don't have to follow the Bagley King Act so any of the any two of the three can make a quorum right so no three out of three makes a quorum two out of three does not make a quorum okay Right, but he wants to change it to right. And then, a quorum. Then, then it's very easy because well, it's not it's not a quorum because we're not following the Bagley King Act. It's a committee with two members, and they can meet anytime, anywhere, anytime, anywhere, and it doesn't have to be uh, open oh, okay. to the public. Okay. You and I could be Saturday morning. Got it. How how does this serve the consumers? I mean, I can understand from a process and efficiency standpoint wanting to reduce it to two, but it, it feels that it, it could also lead and open to problems that that prevents from due diligence and, and dialogue that, that opens up the transparency to the consumer. That could be a potential on whatever the issue might be, but most of these committees are working group uh, committees, 
that I've been involved in so far, and there really hasn't been a huge issue set forward. It's not like we're like reviewing a case or setting a policy. And, and for the most part, our, our groups of two have been uh, posted in open meetings, but. If there's no meeting, then they have less input. It's a good question. <laughs> it is a good question. And up until, well, it really only went into effect about a year and a half ago, at most two years ago. They were never public meetings. In fact, we didn't have subcommittee meetings. Uh, and this was initiated with a prior executive officer in hopes that being open and available to the public would prevent any concerns and there is no there's no involvement of the public they don't attend and most of the time anything we're doing is not contentious and we've also just voted to have four board meetings so we're open and available to the public that much more uh, I don't think in this particular case especially the executive management committee meeting that uh, the, the public is harmed by not being available most of the committee meetings are deciding what's going to be on the agenda for public discussion. Okay, so is there um, any more discussion on this? I hear a motion to reduce the executive board back to two people. I make a motion to reduce the executive board committee to two people. I'll second that. Any discussion now? Any comment from the public? All right, we'll take a roll call. Neil? Mansdorf, aye. Michael Zaff, aye. Judy Manzi, aye. Maria Cadenas, I abstain. All right. Okay. And you had one more motion. And then now we have to choose who is going to participate. So before motion. we make an motion, does anybody feel really compelled to move their committee assignments? Okay, good thinking. I do have a recommendation since we do have a new board member. I believe we have Ms. Dixon on two committees. Let me see. We have Dr. Zapp on two committees. Dr. Zapp is on three committees. Or three. <laughs> it's because you're president. Well, I will relinquish my um, public education to our new board member. Maria? I'm explaining the committees there. Yeah, if we, before I get appointed, I'd like to review what the <laughs> committee's thought. What are you getting appointed to? So, the public education that one. Yeah, so the public education committee, you know, that is the one that he's speaking of. It's sort of like the newsletter. it's the newsletter. It's mm -hmm. website. Website. Yeah, you know, it's a big deal. That's one. Mm -hmm. And then the licensing committee is just you know renewals of licenses, um, making sure you know um, just re reviewing uh, you know, who's who's asking for one, who's not asking one, uh, that kind kind of thing. And, and parenthetically, we have an amazing staff here at, at the board. So a lot of this is handled in-house. Okay. Um, enforcement. Well, I mean, I don't know what is enforcement. When you go, it reviewed, you know, those things we just reviewed, all these cases. Got it. Um, sort of just manages those as they come through. Mm -hmm. And then um, the legislative committee. Um, that works with, you know, all the, yeah. the you know, all the board things that they're taking out, and then the executive management committees. So right now, all of our committees have two members of the board, except for the executive management team. Yeah. And two members too. And that become two members as well. I see. And and Dr. Saft, you're saying that that you would. Uh, no, the, the, I'm also on legislative. No, I, I'm on the. Um, 
Public Legislative in. Committee for the California Podiatric Medical Association, too. So it's kind of nice having access to other people's view and opinions on those bills that I can bring back to the podiatric board. Right. I think it's a complimentary position. Right. Well, at this time, I'm, I'm comfortable with public education. Um, assuming Ms. Dixon, who is not here, uh, remains in her current two positions. And if that changes, we can review it again at the next committee. Uh, she next board. three. She gets three. And it's possible no. that Ms. Elliott might want to move to, and she'll be, she's no longer on the executive committee. So yeah, so maybe, maybe we need to talk to the missing board members if, 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 if before we move the chessboard around. Um, I think it might just be prudent. But, you know. Well, if we're thinking about having a meeting in March, we usually have it three weeks before the committee meeting, three weeks before uh, the full board meeting. Mm -hmm. So, um, so fine. I, I will accept to be on the public education committee through the March board meeting. At which time we can retake uh, committee assignments. That seems reasonable. That's a great idea. Wait, there's some discussion. Okay. Would Dr. Manstorf like to be on another committee? No, I'm fine on the enforcement committee. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hey, was this brought to my attention too? There needs to be a motion to remove Miss Elliott from the Executive Management Committee. We just had that motion. But my you understanding didn't was the was on it. Oh, no, that wasn't we, the motion. Right, the motion was to reduce, reduce. the size, but right. not so a member. Who made that motion? I did. Can you revise your motion to say that the executive manager can be only consists of the president and vice president? Okay. Yes, the executive management committee. I make a motion that the executive management committee be the president and vice president. I'll second that. Dr. Manzor. Discussion. Okay. <laughs> I'm just thinking in terms of the ability to, to have the meeting, although it's easier now if it's not public, yeah. uh, but that you do have a secretary, vice president, and president, and that if it's any one of the executive members that could be in attendance, so you need two. Yeah. How does that work? That's what I thought that was, that was what you originally yeah. said. Because if we just remove the secretary, then then you have the same issue. One doesn't show up, then you don't have quorum if the whole thing was to be efficiency. And I, I think that the executive committee, then if it's reduced to two, right now it's all uh, members of the profession and you're missing a community voice in that executive agenda setting. So I would be very cautious about just limiting the type of officer who would be part of that committee meeting. Kathy? I would like to to bring up some history, if I remember correctly, wasn't this within the purview of the president to assign the committee rather than you all kind of choose? Because the reason I'm showing a little reluctance to go on putting it over to March is we have to work together before March to have the committee meetings. And if I remember correctly, it was an assignment more so than a choice. Right. Well, I'm going to assign I mean, if somebody a, a made a motion that you to public would education and we are reducing the executive board to two members, and that's gonna be the president and vice president. And I don't see how you, you, uh, you can have three board members, only two of which need, that, that's not gonna fly. I'm gonna point out that the administrative manual for the board on page 15 specifies that the executive management committee is comprised of the board's president and vice president elected annually. And then the board president, as determined by the board president, the committee may also include a ranking member of the board or another member. So effectively, it's up to you whether or not there's a third or fourth member. But if I do that, then we're not going to have a quorum if one of them does not show up. You don't need a quorum. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an advisory meeting. committee, yeah. right. Um, for the purpose of making recommendations to the board. So um, to the extent a member of 
the, the executive committee, if there's only two and one of them doesn't show, th nothing happens. So, you know what, as a matter of fact, I think Kathleen and I had a couple public education meetings. It was just the two of us. Yeah. And there were three people on it. Right. But what I'm suggesting is in the last cycles, uh, you know, at this meeting, it was recognized that the president would be giving you your assignments probably before the beginning of the year or something. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we did it that way so that yes. he was able to use his judgment, making sure you were all happy <laughs> on these committees and that it would all work out for your time schedules and things like that. And then we could start at the beginning of the year working with you. So if I understand correctly, right. based on the guidelines, the president can appoint committee members as you see fit, right. and the executive committee is the president and the vice president to which you may invite other members at any time you may wish. The right. issue arises if you have more than two board members attending, it has to be a public noticed meeting. It has to be open to the public. So I think the goal here was to have an executive committee that could meet, it didn't always have to be public unless three people or more were attending. And we needed a functional executive committee and that if only one member showed, you couldn't get anything done. But the third member will be at the bequest of the president. So if the president didn't want to or felt that there was no need for a public notice, he or she may limit that meeting to the president and vice president without extending an invitation to another. If you invited a third member, it has to be noticed. Right, and I don't see the problem with that since that's to the public benefit. But if the, it, because it's not a requirement to have three members at that meeting, your requirement is to have the president and vice president. If an issue arises where well, you need to have another board member, I think the public deserves that notice. Right, but. So if we invite here, the third member and that member does not show up, can you still hold the meeting? You could at, at that point, um, because the committee, if it's officially comprised of only two, you can have the meeting, and it also meets a quorum standard because at least two, as long as at least two members show up, and the third is the only one absent. The problem is the third one, we've, we've posted the presence, public presence, mm -hmm. and the public shows up and there's no one there, that's another violation. If, okay, so I see your point. If many times with these committees, it's um, held telephonically. Right. So, you know, everybody can participate as quickly as possible because they're in their own location. When you have to publicly notice because there's a third person, um, and that third person doesn't participate, there was a public meeting location noticed on that agenda, which means that if no one's there, you can't hold the meeting. So, correct. If all three members don't show up, you can't have the meeting. Right. And, and the problem, too, is, you know, some of these committee meetings, like I'd have to secure a room at Kaiser that was handicap accessible, that was open to the public, that I had a telephone, so that, you know, because that's where you're posting that this meeting's gonna happen. But again, the interest is the public, and I understand the complexity and the issue in terms of, of trying to be pragmatic and, and prudent, but the, to me, my concern is the public changing our process to limit explicitly the committee to two people when that can already be done by simply the president not extending an invitation to a third party only puts into uh, legislative, into process in writing, the limitation of access to the public. If the president decides that he or she never wants to invite a third person to that executive meeting, then don't do it. Then that challenge of having to meet public notice is not met. However, if there's an issue where the president feels that they need a third or fourth person, they need to invite and announce it to the public. I don't see that the reasoning for changing it uh, because the, as it stands right now, it seems to meet the needs and the concerns being raised by this group. Same thing with the committees. I don't see the need to say we have to forcibly limit the attendance of the executive committee to two people. I, I know we just voted on it, but it, it seems to me that it doesn't serve the public when the president already has that authority to simply not extend an invitation to a third member. Several question. If there's two people at a meeting, 
this, if a third board member wanted to dial in, that makes it a violation if they were to participate, because it wasn't. Right, three or more, if they are meeting to discuss board mis bi business, that must be publicly noticed 10 days prior to the meeting. So a third person, a third board member, couldn't just uh, participate last minute. It would have to be notice. a 10-day notice agenda to the public. Does anybody know what other boards do? I'm just curious. A lot of boards just have two members, and they don't public... Uh, uh, they don't uh, go by the Bagley King Act. Kathleen, you were going to mention. I just wanted to mention the history for anyone who doesn't remember. We we passed a new law in '16 that became effective in '17, creating a secretary position that didn't exist, and that's what put the executive committee into this bind where we were having regular meetings, but then in '17, one person doesn't show it. It's a waste. It, it, it's not in the interest of the public. But we that kind of effort too. You've got so much, you know, ready to go, and then one person doesn't show, and it doesn't go. So it wasn't that we intended to put three people on that committee, and then it, our hands became tied. It was that we created the new position, automatically put them onto the executive committee. And we realized it's not working. So I just wanted to bring that up that that was a brand new thing for seventeen. So we tried to make it work, but it it doesn't work if somebody doesn't show up, and you can't just say, okay, well, it's. You're in surgery, but you'll be done by two. Well, we can meet at two o'clock. Well, you can't do it if it's three people. If it's two, you can right. okay, I'll call you at two. But I understand what Maria is saying is she says if the if the president feels an issue needs to have another board member, where well, we need to public notice. Right. Well, they you absolutely. Always can. You yeah. always could. You can. You could. We can do an emergency board meeting. So you know. Right, you're always capable of, of doing of having an open meeting. Mm -hmm. I think the executive management committee is critical. It needs to happen, and you, it's frustrating when you're required to have three and only two show or one shows. So I would argue that at a minimum, president and vice president plan to attend the meeting in the event they know that they cannot attend, that they make arrangements to have the secretary Fill mm -hmm. the slot, but you're required to have two attend. Isn't that already what's in the books, Tara? That I misunderstood. I thought that was already in place that the executive team already had two. Correct. Um, the executive team is comprised of the president, and vice president, per the administrative manual. When the president wants um, someone else to attend, the president can elect to do that. So what's interesting here is if it's just a two-member committee and for whatever reason the president um, determines that or even the executive committee made of two members determines that it would be helpful to have a third, they could do the publicly notice meeting, 10-day advance notice, that third person can't show up, the public meeting is then canceled and then the two-member executive committee could still meet because then it's only two per the um, established committee. That's that's possible too. So that that's the current state. So the well, that's what's in the administrative manual currently. Though there have been three members elected to this executive committee which has created a, a lot of calamity because of the public notice issue. So we're not looking to change the administrative manual. We're simply looking to remove the current secretary from the executive committee. Is that what I'm... Management. Management committee. Well, that's the motion that's on the table. That was already voted on, wasn't it? I, I well, thought she, so. We changed her motion, to a new motion, to make it the president and vice president. She just said before two people. So the way I understood it was there was a motion that was final, which was um, to reduce the number of the members on the executive management committee yeah. to two, two. and then there was a new motion to uh, remove. No, to define it as the president, and vice president. Okay. That does remove is the, is that the does remove as the executive manager. So we're defining the board, the mm -hmm. board as president and vice president. 
if we're down to two and we're going by the executive or the administrative manual, the the manual itself says who those two members are. Okay. So we don't need the motion. I withdraw the motion. Okay. Okay. So to get back to these committees. So we're going to keep them the way they are till till, till March, and you're going to. Go on the public I will assign people to their committees. Okay, okay. So, Mr. Neslin, anything else in your report? I think that's it. All right. So now I'd like to accept a motion to accept all of the executive officers' report, A through F. I make a motion to accept the. Um, Executive report to A2F. Second. Cadenas, aye. Okay, so we'll, we'll have our little roll call. Oh, yeah, sorry, welcome. Uh, Cadenas, aye. Judy Nancy, aye. Michael Zaff, aye. Neil Manstorf, aye. And that we accepted all of them. Thank you. So next we're going to a closed session to discuss our thoughts of our executive officer. All right. This is okay. going to take hours, so <laughs> we have a phone number. I'd like to call the meeting back to order. The next, the last thing on our agenda is to discuss the timing and location of our meetings next year, which presumably will be March, June, September, and December. Uh, a proposal we have heard would be the March meeting at the Podiatry School in Pomona, the June meeting in this room, September we would meet at Kaiser facility in San Jose, Santa Clara. Santa Clara, and December we'll be back here again. In Santa Clara, the new one. Yeah, the new hospital. It was the, gre it was the greenest hospital in America until somebody else built it more. <laughs> Any comments? September <laughs> I think we just moved that a week back. forward. Back. A week backwards? Oh, well, wait, if it's like the first, we go to the next week. The eighth, 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 eighth. I have a calendar here, so. Every day is the third. So it's suggesting the second. Yes. special like video stuff set up for that or whatever how does that work I think DCA provides all that yeah it's the usual traveling kit this yeah okay, great. do you go to San Jose do they have somebody there it could be me it could be one of the other two of me <laughs> Sacto here? Yeah. Uh, June 1st, Sacramento. Mm -hmm. okay. 
under seven, uh, possibly San Jose. Santa Clara. Santa Clara. And then December 7th, second. So third, January, March 2nd. Pomona. June. June 3rd. And then it'll be in Sacramento. Does that need a motion? Um, so we have a motion to calendar day. Discussion, let's see. No. Um, <clears throat> you could do a motion to approve the um, 2018 calendar dates. So moved. Okay. I, okay. Uh, These, uh, there's a good reason they may change by a week or two here or there, but go ahead and propose it. Okay. I move that we adopt the 2018 calendar dates. And that includes March 2nd in Pomona, June 3rd in Sacramento, September June 1st. For me? June 1st. Yeah. Oh, June 1st. September 7th in Santa Clara and December 3rd? Seven. September 7th. September 7th in Santa, Seven, Clara, Santa Clara and December 3rd. December 7th. 7th in Sacramento. I'll second. Start with Maria. Roll. Say, say your name and name. Judy Manzi, aye. Mike Zaffi. Neil Manster, aye. Aye. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Do I hear a motion to. No. There, uh, anything for future meetings? Yeah, we, have to, we have to talk about that. We, uh, oh. Like a community. Okay. So, so we, we have an upcoming board meeting, and this is future agenda items for the next board meeting. Okay. So I think we should dedicate some time to looking into, um, um, I guess, of the whole issue of diabetes and how it does play a role in our um, efforts here. It, you know, even hearing today about like his issues with getting Medi-Cal to pay for diabetic care for the indigent or um, just the frustrations, I guess, of access education regarding the disease. Um, I think we should spend some time either looking into how we can support any effort that's moving in that direction as, podiat as a podiatry profession, I guess. So um, if you, if it's okay, I'd like to actually spend about ten minutes in a small presentation that I want want you guys to listen to, just re and it just discusses basically the financial impact um, and some real hard numbers um, regarding diabetes in, in California and the amount of healthcare dollars in our state that is spent um, in diabetic foot care. Okay, so can you put that on the. Okay, I'll work with you when we get closer to drafting that agenda of who's presenting and Great. the topics. Okay, perfect. If there's any way to discuss the impact of future baby boomer retirement on the future budget of the department of the, uh, the board. So like look into like what are, the age like demographics, like our attrition rate. In California. Yeah, what, what, what are we expecting to see in, in five and fifteen years? Right? It would be interesting to see what the age. Like, uh, what, what kind of what what number of podiatrists will be contributing dues in five, ten, and fifteen years? 
kind of discussing the, the budget and the solvency of the board and, and including a discussion of, of the age getting the baby boomer impact. You know, it's actually an interesting topic because being on the Federation of State Boards, one of the things we do is we collect this fee from all the different state boards. And um, when you see the num I can bring those numbers actually, the numbers of podiatrists that practice in these boards, there are some, there are boards in the, in the United States that literally, you know, almost just aren't existent because there's like, you know, 15 podiatrists in the state. I mean, it, it's it's interesting, you know, to see like we have a very robust board because, uh, you know, we have, a, we have a lot of people participating as you know podiatrists in the state, but it is pretty awful because they have different problems, you know, especially when it comes to um, discipline because they don't have any money to really take care of it. We're kind of lucky here that some of that stuff's shared. And then I have a recommendation for an agendized item for March. It's that time again, strategic plan. So um, I think we got pulled for the second quarter, was it? So I don't know if we'll be starting by March or not. But I don't think so. I don't think so either. So at least I'll have an introduction of how we want to go about that. And also, are we uh, completing the disciplinary guidelines? Yes. Okay. You will probably, and we're hoping, crossing our fingers, uh, to have the first draft to the board members in March. Yeah. We have that uh, the first rough draft, and trust me, it is a load of work, a lot of strikeouts, underlines, new language. So it's pretty meticulous work. And then when we punt it over to Terra, it, it becomes <laughs> it becomes more and more and more. It's it's a nightmare. But we'll definitely get it there. Um were you also um you had talked about the um, unscheduled fees? Yeah, I mean, this isn't a complete list of things that are, the normal things will still be on the agenda, but mm -hmm. I think we're just bringing up the new things um, and everything we always do. The rags, the laws. Motion to adjourn. Can I accept the motion to adjourn? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll second it. <laughs> Neil? Roll Master Fi. Mike Neil makes the motion to adjourn. Judy Mandy, aye. Cadena, aye. All right.